news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. And good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Today, the January 6th committee surprise session set for about an hour from now. The key witness, Cassidy Hutchinson, former aide to Mark Meadows, President Trump's chief of staff. But first, we begin with the latest on abortion. Health and Human Services Secretary Javier Becerra holding a press conference just a bit ago to discuss the Biden administration's response to last week's Supreme Court decision overturning Roe versus Wade. HHS has been preparing for this for some time. That's why earlier this year, we launched our HHS Reproductive Access Task Force to plan for every action necessary to protect women's access to reproductive health care. There is no magic bullet, but if there is something we can do, we will find it and we will do it at HHS. And for more on this, ABC News Senior National Policy Correspondent Ann Flaherty joining me now to discuss. So Ann, just kind of help us understand here how the how HHS and, and Biden and this action plan actually assists women in states where abortion is currently illegal. Well, you know, you heard from the Secretary Becerra, he said there's not a lot that he can do. There is no magic bullet to respond to this, but he hinted that there could be some more things to come. You know, we know that telehealth medicine, for example, is available in some states. He mentioned that. He mentioned that the medication abortion is widely available in states like California and New York. The question, though, is, of course, how do you get it to women in states like Arkansas and South Dakota that are banning this? Uh, and he acknowledged there is no loophole here that we can exploit. So what he was trying to achieve today was giving the American public some basic facts about going to abortionfinder.org is one site that you can look at and see what your options are. He talked about wanting to make sure that people know that if you are on Medicaid, which is a very large insurance plan uh, funded by the government, that there are exceptions for rape and incest, for example even though some states do not include those exceptions. So, you know, he told us to stay tuned. This is not going, progressives aren't going to be happy with this. They wanted to hear more today. Um, but he says that they are still working on this. They want to be on solid legal ground. All right, so how much of what Becerra said, though, is actually existing policy? And does what he say change anything? So, Kara, almost everything that he mentioned today was existing policy, uh, but it's a question of whether or not the government can enforce it. So, for example, under Medicaid, as I mentioned, it would cover abortion in cases of rape and incest. So if you're living in Arkansas and you're denied that care, um, it's possible that the federal government will try to defend a person who is, has been denied that uh, exem exception. Um, it, you know, but everything else that he mentioned, he talked about wanting to ensure that people have access to contraceptives. He talked talked about family planning and, and making sure that CMS, which is the, the federal agency that regulates uh, health care providers, that they have what they need to make sure that Americans have access to family planning services. These are things that have always existed. That doesn't change anything right now. Um, it, he did hint at something related to the FDA, that the FDA might uh, consider expanding access to mifepristone, but we don't have those details. So not a lot to, to hang on to just yet. Uh, we're still trying to sort through those details. I think what this shows us is how legally complex this is um, and, and how careful the administration wants to be on this. So Becerra also says he will direct the Center for Medicare and Medicaid services to take every legal available step to protect family planning care. So what would those options actually be? Uh, well, I think one of the things that they're talking about is making sure that people have access to Plan B. So there's a lot of misinformation out there. People think seem to confuse Plan B with the abortion pill. Plan B is something that you take after protected sex uh, to prevent a pregnancy. It is not something that causes an abortion. This is different than the abortion pill. Um, this is something that they want to make sure that families have access to, people have access to, because they consider that a port important preventative measure. Um, you know, I think that they're going to be trying to 
uh, increase the resources that federal government puts towards these family pla family planning services. But really, their hands are tied on so many of these points. I mean, there's only so much you can do when you run into conflict with state law. So a lot of this is going to still end up in the courts when it comes to anything related to abortion outside of contraception. All right, Ann Flaherty will be talking a lot about this for sure, especially as we start moving toward the ballot box. Thanks, Ann. So in less than an hour, the committee investigating the January 6th attack on the Capitol will hold its next hearing. Committee members originally planned for a few weeks in between hearings to go over new evidence before making this surprise announcement that they will be holding a hearing today. We are expecting to see some of that new evidence as we hear from Cassidy Hutchinson, a former top advisor to President Trump's chief of staff, Mark Meadows. Well, she's expected to talk about what happened behind closed doors in the White House giving more insight into what Mark Meadows actually did and said as he interacted with his boss, Donald Trump, in the days before and after the insurrection. ABC News Chief Washington Correspondent John Carl has the latest on what to expect from Capitol Hill. Today, the January 6th committee will hear from a White House advisor who was right there in the West Wing on January 6th and in the days and weeks leading up to the attack on the Capitol. Her name is Cassidy Hutchinson. Her appearance was first reported by Punchbowl News. She was an assistant to Mark Meadows, the chief of staff, and she was in the West Wing while the attack on the Capitol was unfolding, a direct witness to uh, the efforts by those closest to Donald Trump to try to get him to to do something or to say something to call off his supporters, to get them to stand down. Uh, she has already testified three times in closed or uh, but taped depositions before the committee. And based on what she has told the committee, investigators believe that she is truly one of the key, one of the star witnesses of their investigations. Of their investigation. One of the things that she has testified about uh, already in closed door deposition, I am told, is that she witnessed Mark Meadows actually burning documents in the fireplace in the chief of staff's office in the White House. Uh, so this should be uh, potentially very interesting, very compelling testimony. Yeah, it's really like a scene out of scandal. John Carl, thank you so much. Our team coverage continues right now. Let's go ahead and start on the Hill with our Alex Prache. Alex, uh, we heard about Cassidy Hutchinson and saw the tape testimony actually where she's naming Republican members of Congress who she said actually requested pardons from then President Trump. So what exactly does she know? Well, Kira, I think first off, she is one of a few aides that have been willing to testify, but also in terms of what she know, well, knows, well, Cassidy Hutchinson can be a voice to some of the internal interactions that were happening inside the White House in the days leading up to January 6th on that actual day and the subsequent days after. And, and I think something else uh, that's, that's, that's going to be a point of focus for this, uh, for this committee is uh, what can she say about Mark Meadows and his knowledge uh, of the violence of that day. Uh, was he notified of potential threats against the former vice president? And then also keep in mind, she was in a rare position to actually have knowledge of all of the former president's uh, appointments, his calendar, uh, who he was having meetings with, which we know uh, has been a focal point of this committee, which members of Congress were calling and trying to get in touch with the president. I, I suspect that that could be something that she's called uh, in, in, in question about uh, today. Sure. Let's take it now. The president of Constitutional Accountability Center, Elizabeth Wydra. Elizabeth Hutchinson has testified that Meadows actually burned documents in his office. I mean, really, it's, it's straight out of a scene from scandal, uh, and especially when you think of former President Trump and, and when all that came to light about flushing documents, you know, down the toilet in the White House. I mean, it, it, it could mean a lot for, for Meadows and what how he was actually involved and, and what he was doing. 
Yeah, I mean, you're exactly right. And the January 6th committee has in some ways a, a difficult task because so many of these facts just seem so outrageous. And, you know, I think for so many of us, it's even seeing the footage of the violence on the day of January 6th, it's really hard to let it sink in that that actually happened. But that's what the committee needs to do. And the testimony that we're going to hear today brings together a lot of the different threads of the conspiracy that the committee has been telling the nation about. The conspiracy by Trump and his allies to retain power regardless of the vote of the people, regardless of the law. Um, so she can testify to things before January 6th, during the violence on January 6th. She's talked about the hang Mike Pence chant. Um, and she can talk about the days after January 6th. This burning of papers has to do with um, apparently a meeting with Congressperson Perry, who was instrumental in trying to get Jeffrey Clark installed as a puppet head of the Department of Justice. We heard about that in the last January 6th committee. And she also talked about the pardons that several members of Congress apparently sought um, after their involvement in this. So uh, let's take it over to you, Amanda, Chief Executive Officer of Code for America. What about the newly obtained evidence? What can you tell us about what we could possibly learn from what apparently the committee has gotten its hands on? Well, here's what's interesting is when you're actually talking to a chief of staff who's right in the middle of things, often they are very trusted, not only by the members they serve, but in the body at large. And especially given how long she has been in these kinds of spaces, she has built a matter of trust. She was in the room. Um, the story is Mark Meadows really always wanted her in the room. That gives her a particular view of what has happened here and to be able to connect the pieces. It is particularly relevant if she was in the room for any of burning documents it is a clear understanding if you are a staffer in that room, you know where the lines are and having been on the front of that and now being able to speak about it, um, that is a true, um, a true account of what was happening, who was in the room, who knew and what they were doing. Um, and that part, I think, is where we hear about the concerns about safety and her own security uh, means that she was in the room for some things that everyone knew was wrong at that very moment. And now um, we're going to hear about it today. And let's take it over to you, Barbara Comstock, uh, former Republican Congresswoman from Virginia. Does Hutchinson's testimony hold any power over the political careers of those Republicans, specifically that were asking for a pardon? Well, sure. I, I think her honest and accurate testimony is going to be very effective because this is the kind of person who all of us in Congress have around us who knows everything that's going on in our lives a lot of things that we may forget. And I can imagine a lot of these guys, and let's face it, except for like Marjorie Greene, you know, it was pretty much a bunch of guys, were coming in and they don't really pay any attention to the smart young woman who's there doing all the work. And so they've probably forgotten things that they've said around her or things they said to her, but she remembers it because her whole job was to take care of Mark Meadows and she was there by his side every day. And I think it's also important to point out that she changed lawyers in this process. After being deposed once, uh, she chose then to get, um, I think, a non-Trump lawyer, a more independent lawyer, and come forward and speak. So I think this is somebody who, unlike a lot of the you know older people who should have been out front the way she has been, she's someone who has been very brave and courageous and will have a very accurate testimony. I point out she also interned for Ted Cruz and Steve Scalise. So this is someone who's a Republican, a conservative, who went into government, I'm sure, hoping, you know, she could be of service. And now she's here in the middle of this. And, you know, it's got to be tough on her, but my hat's off to her. All right. Alex, Elizabeth, Amanda. Barbara, thank you so much. And make sure that you tune into our live coverage of the January 6th hearing, 1 p.m., right here on ABC News Live, about 45 minutes away. All right, coming up, dozens of migrants dead in a suspected case of human smuggling in Texas. What happened and where does the investigation go from here? Also ahead, overturning Roe versus Wade, political strife, primary voters, and all of the impact straight ahead. This is GMA3, what you need to know. GMA3. A third hour of Good Morning America.
in the afternoon. It's all about you. Lunchtime on ABC. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions. Straightforward reporting. No spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. This season, we're taking it up a level. I'm teaching my celebrity guests survival skills. Your life will depend on it. Then they need to face the wild alone. Ah! And failure is not an option. I'm sure if he's asking me to do it, I can do it, right? And all of a sudden, he's gone. He doesn't even cook your breakfast or anything. Everything's lethal out here. There's no turning back. Oh, God! Oh! Who talked me into this? Running Wild with Bear Grylls. New season, Monday, July 25th at 9 on National Geographic. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7 straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Steve, Martin, Selena. This week, they're taking a break from solving murders in the building to be on GMA. Fantastic. <laughs> Plus, country music star Jimmy Allen performing for you this week on Good Morning America. More performances by Dr. Bull. That rocks. <laughs> He's got the moves that make your animals groove. Let's go. It's a show you won't want to miss. I'm not going to be here forever. Maybe. <laughs> the Incredible Dr. Paul, Saturday, July 16th at 9 on Net Geo Wild. All right, welcome back. Some of the day's top headlines for you now. It's being called one of the worst suspected cases of human smuggling to date. At least 50 people found dead, including children, inside a tractor trailer near San Antonio. Rescuers pulled 16 people from the truck still alive, but suffering from heat exhaustion as temperatures topped 100 degrees. Federal investigators now questioning three suspects who may be involved. President Biden releasing a statement just moments ago calling the incident a horrifying and heartbreaking tragic loss of life. Ghislaine Maxwell expected to be sentenced today for helping convicted sex offender Jeffrey Epstein sexually abuse underage girls. Maxwell was convicted in December of sex trafficking and other crimes. Prosecutors are asking for a prison sentence of at least 30 years. New details on that Missouri Amtrak train derailment. At least three people are dead, dozens more injured after a train collided with a dump truck. That train was carrying more than 240 people from Los Angeles to Chicago when eight passenger cars derailed, turning most of that train entirely onto its side. The NTSB is now investigating. And today, voters will head to the polls for the first time since Roe versus Wade was overturned. And here to tell us what to expect, ABC News political director Rick Klein with Rick's Picks. All right, Rick, let's start with abortion, shall we? It is on the ballot today, even in blue states. Let's break it all down. Yeah, Kira, it's the first time we see voters voting since Roe v. Wade. And the states that I have an eye on today are blue-ish states that nonetheless have very competitive Republican primaries and a lot of Republican hopes. Take a look at a place like Colorado, Illinois, even blue New York. These are places that in the past have elected Republican governors, and now the stakes may be higher than ever because they are places that all right now have protections for abortion rights. That could change depending on if the Republicans win, and that could depend a lot on what kind of candidates they nominate today. I mean, even in a state like New York, this is the map uh, of the 2020 presidential election results, the re-elect for Trump. You can see big swaths of red across New York State. Of course, the population centers like New York City, downstate, Buffalo, upstate. But you see a lot of Trump red. That's what gives Republicans their congressman. Lee Zeldin represents this eastern part of Long Island. He is the leading Republican candidate. He's expected to beat uh, Rudy Giuliani's son, Andrew Giuliani. But both of those candidates, all of those Republicans, say they would roll back protections for abortion rights. So is it too early to protect or pre predict, rather, how the Supreme Court decision will play out in November? 
Yeah, the, the short answer is yes. I, I think it's going to be different in different places because you've got states like New York and a Colorado, frankly, that, that have a lot of geographic diversity. You can see here you've got big swaths of red in the outer parts of the state, bluer parts of the center. It is going to be different district by district, and the state of the law, of course, is different in different places as well. All right, let's move on to Colorado. Interesting strategy from Dems when it comes to who they're running against. So what's going on there? Yeah, this is a tried and true strategy, but it might be riskier than ever. We have Democrats spending very heavily to choose their own opponent in this race. They are spending millions of dollars to attack one Senate candidate and one gubernatorial candidate as, quote, too conservative for Colorado. Now, that's an attack only in a, in a very, uh, uh, you know, very uh, ephemeral way because everyone involved knows that calling someone too conservative is a good thing in a Republican primary. Again, look at all that red in a state like Colorado. What they're doing there is trying to select the person that they perceive to be the weaker opponent. The flip side of that is that you have an opponent uh, in, in the Senate race and in the gubernatorial race, both of whom say they would, they would uh, essentially outlaw abortion entirely, and both of whom deny the legitimacy of the last election. So you're elevating these people that Democrats are saying are, are real threats to democracy because it makes them potentially easier to beat. That is a dangerous game. And some big time incumbents from both parties, right, could lose their primaries tonight. Who are you watching? Yeah, Kira, primaries will, will determine uh, who goes home. And there's at least two incumbents who are going to lose their seats in Congress because of redistricting. Uh, first, you've got a Republican on Republican primary in the redder parts of the middle part of Illinois. You've got uh, Mary Miller and Rodney Davis. Mary Miller's the candidate just endorsed by Trump uh, who appeared to misspeak over the weekend in thanking, uh, in thanking President Trump for, uh, for what, he, what she called, quote, white life. She walked that back, but that has become a major issue in that campaign. And here in the, in the Chicago suburbs, you have a smaller district where Marie Newman and Sean Caston, again, because of redistricting, uh, are pitted against each other. What's interesting there, Marie Newman essentially won her seat against a different Democratic incumbent in the last cycle who considered himself to be pro-life. So abortion rights played big into her win. Does she survive against a well-funded and, and, and rather entrenched incumbent today? All right. Rick, thank you so much. Appreciate it. And ABC News Live will have complete election coverage tonight right here starting at 7 p.m. Eastern. We hope you will tune in. Coming up, President Biden in Madrid. It's a high-profile meeting with NATO leaders pushing to strengthen alliances in the face of the persistent Russian assault on Ukraine. We are live from Kyiv when we return. we come from and where we belong. This is the story of how we live, how we survive for thousands of years. We're still maintaining our culture and we're fighting for it generation after generation. It's important to pass these skills on. We make it work out here. Something very beautiful about it. I know what happened and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart they did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Tonight, the unplanned January 6th public hearing, what new evidence has revealed. Plus, as the Supreme Court rules on more cases, the fallout of the Roe v. Wade continues. More Americans turn to World News tonight with David Muir, the most watched program on all of television. Streaming live, dozens found dead inside a tractor trailer in Texas. Suspected human smuggling, what we know now, reports from the scene. Live streaming now free on ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news.
so glad you're streaming with us today. You know, President Biden has arrived in the Spanish capital of Madrid, where he plans to attend a NATO leader summit today. The president is expected to push for Finland and Sweden's full NATO membership, seeking, seeking rather a stronger alliance against Russia and Vladimir Putin. This high profile meeting comes on the heels of the G7 meeting in Germany, where leaders committed to fight food insecurity and rising energy prices, supporting the reconstruction of Ukraine and also cooperating on climate change. We've got team coverage with ABC News White House correspondent Mary Alice Parks, who is traveling with the president. We also have foreign correspondent Tom Suvi Burridge. He's joining us live from Ukraine. Mary Alice, Western leaders met virtually with President Zelensky. We talked about that yesterday, calling Russia's attack at a shopping mall a, a war crime. Have there been any talks of criminal charges or any other type of response? Strong action. Yeah, the G7 leaders, including President Biden, put out a joint statement yeah. about that horrific attack, saying that Russia needed to be held accountable. And we heard the president over the weekend say that these continued attacks that seem to be targeting civilian areas, or at least having the impact on civilian areas, were a sign of Russia's barbarism. And it was interesting, just moments ago, we heard from the president again praising the bravery of Ukraine. He said they are standing up to Russia in a way that no one anticipated, showing enormous bravery, enormous resolve. A big focus of these NATO meetings is not only how to continue to support Ukraine, get uh, you know weapons, get money to them efficiently, but also how to defend NATO's own borders. We're expecting to hear some announcements about that in the coming days too, Kira. All right. And Tom, uh, Biden and, uh, and Spain's president speaking today on these new areas of cooperation between the two countries and how they're going to keep supporting Ukraine. They didn't mention that attack on the shopping mall, which we continue to learn a lot about. Zelensky says the death toll, death toll could be unimaginable. So what else do we know? Kira, we know that 18 people have been confirmed dead in that horrific attack. Remember, it happened in the middle of the afternoon, a crowded shopping mall in the city of Kremenchuk. That's in central Ukraine. But the crucial thing at the moment, I think, is that more than 20 people are said to be missing. So the death toll could rise significantly. A number of people injured, uh, many of them seriously. And really, Ukraine is saying that the air raid sirens there were going off at the time. Some people did heed the warning and get out. But because life, the war, is just such a normal part, really, of everybody's lives at the moment now in Ukraine, many people did not get out of that building. I mean, let me just talk you through where we are. We're at the centre of a strike, the location of a strike on Sunday. That's a kindergarten over there. It's a residential part of central Kiev. You can just make out the side of a massive crater where the missiles came in here. One man was killed close to here, his daughter and his wife injured. And we're really seeing an uptick in missile strikes by Russia on Ukraine around the G7, around that NATO summit too. Mary Alice, uh, G7 leaders saying that they will take immediate action to secure energy supply and also reduce price surges, uh, potentially uh, using price caps. How could this all work and what would it mean short term? Yeah, the G7 leaders want to leverage the fact that they control a lot of the shipping lanes that are used to transport Russian oil. Now, we've seen the U.S. and some European partners uh, ban Russian oil, but they know the Russian oil is still, of course, getting out into the global market. And in fact, Putin and the Russian government has been able to profit a lot on these spikes in energy prices. So they want to find a way to make Putin pay, to make sure that he's not profiting when energy prices are so high. And they want to help uh, consumers back home who are really struggling with these high energy prices. So they're going to try to figure out a way to enforce a price cap on Russian oil. This is complicated. It is far from done. It is unclear if they will be able to figure this out. But Kira, this is exactly the kind of thing that they are huddled on, that they are trying to work on. All right. Mary Alice Parks, Tom Sufi Burridge, thank you both so much. Another January 6 hearing set to begin in just about 30 minutes. This one on the books within the last 24 hours, a surprise session. We've got team coverage right after the break. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. 
This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news. Free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Steve, Martin, Selena. This week, they're taking a break from solving murders in the building to be on GMA. Fantastic. <laughs> Plus, country music star Jimmy Allen performing for you. This week on Good Morning America. Every killer just might think they're pulling off the perfect crime until, well, it's not. What little breadcrumbs do they leave behind? What gives them away? Did the killer commit the perfect crime? Or did he leave one clue? The new true crime series. Because what's often hiding in plain sight between four walls is the fatal flaw. Premieres Thursday night, July 7 on ABC. What are you capable of when you sleep? My wife was asleep on the couch and I kissed her goodnight and went to bed myself. What do you remember? I could see that maybe he was sleepwalking. Sleepwalking? Sleepwalking. What don't you remember? Oh my God. Well, would you remember this? You just murdered your wife. Stabbing her 44 times. I went to bed and when I woke up, my wife is dead and the cops had me on the floor. You do realize how unbelievable this sounds. While he was sleeping, the 2020 event, Friday at 9, 8 central on ABC. Streaming live, dozens found dead inside a tractor trailer in Texas. Suspected human smuggling. What we know now. Reports from the scene. Live streaming now free on ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. We were creating the perfect Mormon family. And then I fell in love with my friend. Yeah, I'm like stupidly in love with her. <laughs> leaving the church was leaving who I was. The lesbian ex-Mormon story is not something that's been shared very much, but I feel like our story needs to be told. Nobody tells you when you're Mormon is that there actually is another way. We know who we are, where we come from, and where we belong. This is the story of how we live, how we survive for thousands of years. We're still maintaining our culture and we're fighting for it generation after generation. It's important to pass these skills on. We make it work out here. Something very beautiful about it. If you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. We're coming back on the air right now because we were just learned that those protesters you saw on the Capitol steps just moments ago have now breached the Capitol are now inside the Capitol. We face what many would view the most direct threat to the grand experiment called democracy in our lifetime. The horror and chaos and the sadness over what has played out in our nation's capital. Images not seen in modern American history. From ABC News Live, Attack on the Capitol, The Investigation. Here now, Kira Phillips. And good afternoon, everyone. So glad that you are with us. Welcome back, and thank you for streaming with us for our special coverage today. The committee investigating the January 6th attack on the Capitol will be holding the next hearing. It was postponed for several weeks, uh, but there is new evidence, and they decided to make this surprise announcement, so they are holding the hearing today. Live pictures now as we monitor those gathering into the room. As soon as it starts, we will bring it to you live. Our team coverage of today's hearing continues right now. We begin with ABC News Chief Washington Correspondent John Carl. Uh, John, we heard Cassidy Hutchinson in tape testimony naming those Republican members of Congress who she said requested pardons from then-President Trump. What more can we expect to hear from her today? What exactly does she know? And how powerful do you think this could be? Kira, Cassidy Hutchinson is uh, a name that virtually no Americans know except for her friends and, and, and former uh, colleagues. Uh, but that will not be the same after this hearing is over. Uh, I, I think Cassidy Hutchinson will, will provide some incredibly compelling testimony. You have to understand that her 
uh, position in the White House. She was uh, the basically the, the personal aide to the chief of staff, Mark Meadows. Uh, her desk was right outside of Mark Meadows' office and right down the hall from the Oval Office. I mean, I'm talking just steps down the hall uh, to, to the Oval Office. As you know, because you have been there, the West Wing of the White House is, is small, and it's all along that same hallway. Uh, and Cassidy Hutchinson was there uh, on January 6th. She was there. Uh, she is the, the first for first real significant witness that we uh, have seen who was truly a witness to what was going on in the White House while the Capitol was under attack. And my understanding is uh, that she has a lot to say, and she saw a lot, and she has uh, already spoken to the committee four times uh, in, in, in closed-door depositions. You've seen little snippets of them, like the one you mentioned, uh, but she uh, I has has spoken, I am told, very candidly and very openly and, um, and, and has a window on what was going on that is unlike any that we have seen so far. You know, you bring up uh, two quick thoughts here, John. You bring up a very good point about, yes, we, we've been in the West Wing clearly dozens and dozens of times, and it, it's tight quarters. Um, it there are aides and assistants and interns and all types of people that are in so close to key players. It's not like they're cordoned off and have a lot of privacy. So you bring up a really interesting point about what she knows, what she heard, what she was a part of. Um, because just to the general public, they may think, oh, you know, what would she really know, you know, behind closed doors? But they know a lot because of how small this space is. And you even tweeted out that this is going to be big and disturbing. Um, that, that disturbing is a pretty strong word. Jump in well, to what you're thinking and what you know and why you use those terms. Well, well my, my understanding is that in addition to the very compelling uh, testimony that we will be hearing uh, from Cassidy Hutchinson, uh, that the committee uh, ha has also uh, obtained evidence uh, about what was going on on January 6th, before uh, the president's speech, during the president's speech, in the days before the speech, uh, and the ultimately the attack on the Capitol. And I, I don't know exactly uh, what that evidence is. As you know, uh, the committee fought all the way up to the Supreme Court to get access to White House records, uh, which they received from the National Archives, uh, a, a batch that just recently went over to the committee. And I, I, my understanding is that this evidence they have seen will provide uh, some some really vivid detail about what was done and what was not done uh, as it was clear that this was going to be a very dangerous day in the Capitol on January 6, 2021. Someone else that knows the players in the quarters very well, ABC News senior national correspondent Terry Moran. Terry, what do you think about the newly obtained evidence and, and this surprise session that the committee has decided uh, to hold today when it was supposed to be postponed for, for quite a while? How, how big of a day do you think this could be? You know, Kira, it's hard to imagine that there are things we don't know about that awful day in, in American history. But the committee does say that they have been talking to people, as John was just reporting, there are people on the inside of the White House who were there. Now, what impact can something like that have? Look, I actually think what is happening is not necessarily bombshells as much as almost a, a kind of tide that is coming in with all of these facts about what was happening uh, in, on the Trump team in the Trump White House after the election that he lost as he tried to steal it up until the violence that was visited upon the Capitol. And I expect that more, that, that sense of great gravity that these hearings have had that does seep into the public mind. People keep, you know, keep wondering, well, what's the headline or what, what's the bombshell? I think the, 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 just the ordinary factual process of unveiling all of their interviews and all of the uh, all of the information they have has a gradual tidal impact and you can tell because Donald Trump is upset about it right he's criticized uh, House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy for not putting Republicans on the panel because he knows that this is having an impact on his version of the story which is false and could damage him, not with his base. Of course, people come out, and there's tens of millions of them who come out for his rallies or will support him, lie down in traffic for him no matter what, but he needs more. 
and there are more people who aren't necessarily Democrats, uh, who are conservatives, who might get the sense that something very serious is being presented in, this, in these hearings uh, and settle in the public mind, in the majority of the public mind, the truth. They're really, I mean, it's kind of hard to be surprised by the Trump administration, uh, Terry, really, from everything that we have learned, right? Going back to just Donald Trump, you know, flushing uh, documents down the toilet and, and the actions that, that he took as president of the United States. And so now we're hearing that, 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 uh, uh, Tra or Meadows uh, aide here talked about Meadows uh, burning documents in his fireplace. Uh, you bring up a good point. Is it really going to be a bombshell or is this sort of what we already know about the Trump administration and, and key players and advisors and the actions that they took and the things that they said? Um, I think the whole entire administration and, and a lot of the actions uh, kept surprising us while covering the four years in office. That's very true, Kira. Uh, what's different, perhaps, is that Donald Trump was center stage and star of the show and dominated, as he, as he does, as he does with great skill, every day's news cycle, and the media ate it up every day as well. What we're hearing from now are the people around him, people more like us, not gigantic, narcissistic, needy uh, performers of the first rank in American politics, really, truly one of the great dominant personalities of American politics. He's not on the stage. Instead, we're hearing from the people who are in the room, who worked with him, who react like we do. Bill Barr saying that, that stuff is crazy, what he's talking about, and all the rest of it. Perhaps that is what, we're, what the value of these hearings are. Sure. So well said, as usual. ABC News Chief Justice Correspondent Pierre Thomas. So does Hutchinson's testimony, Pierre, hold any power over the political careers now of those Republican reps that asked Trump for a pardon? Or does Trump's hold over the party still outweigh the evidence from these hearings? Well, I think the politics will have to see play out. But I think the one thing is that she's a potential witness in the Justice Department's ongoing criminal investigation. Uh, they're looking at not just the violence that took place on January 6th, they're also looking at this whole issue of the fake electors. Was there, was this just a bad legal idea, a crazy legal idea, or was this something more sinister, potential fraud or obstruction of some sort? So that is one of the key things that I'm looking for today as this hearing unfolds. Does she have any facts about, well, who was behind the fake electors? Uh, who was behind uh, this notion? Notion that uh, the vice president um, should not certify the election when the White House counsel's office, the attorney general, Bill Barr, and others were saying that these were non-starters, that this, this type of activity should not be taking place. I think that's the potential here, is that she could provide evidence in that. And the, the hearing is not the only audience uh, for people. The Justice Department is, is watching this very closely. Uh, and I assume if they have not already talked to her, they will want to talk to her in the future. All right. Pierre, thanks so much. Thanks to all our players here. Make sure that you tune in to our live coverage of the January 6th hearing. It is coming up in about 15 minutes or so uh, right here on ABC News Live and also on Hulu. Let's take a live look once again inside the Capitol where we are following all the developments as we wait for the January 6th hearing to begin in less than about 15, 15 minutes or so. Our team coverage continues right after a break. Tonight, the unplanned January 6th public hearing, what new evidence has revealed. Plus, as the Supreme Court rules on war cases, the fallout over Roe v. Wade continues. More Americans turn to World News Tonight with David Muir, the most watched program on all of television. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCNews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCNews.com. Here's to everything ahead. The Boy Scouts knew they had a problem. Parents gave the Boy Scouts the most valuable thing they had, their children. And they told parents, you can trust us. They're unbelievably heartbreaking stories. So many of them are haunted by who they would have become if this never happened to them. 
This is about how to move from victim to survivor. When the detective says he confessed to abuse me, I no longer had to prove to people that I was abused. I was free. We know who we are, where we come from, and where we belong. This is the story of how we live, how we survive for thousands of years. We're still maintaining our culture, and we're fighting for it, generation after generation. It's important to pass these skills on. We make it work out here. Something very beautiful about it. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. So glad you're with us for our special coverage as we are looking at live pictures from inside the hearing room there as the January 6th committee's surprise hearing on the Hill. Uh, after they made this expected, unexpected rather, announcement after postponing the hearings for several weeks, we know now that former top advisor to Trump's chief of staff, Mark Meadows, Cassidy Hutchinson, is the one you're seeing here. She is the one set to testify. She was very close to Mark Meadows, worked very closely with them, and knows about a lot of those conversations about key moments both before and after the insurrection. Our team coverage continues now with ABC News Washington correspondent Alex Perchet, as well as Elizabeth Weidra, president of the Constitutional Accountability Center. Uh, Alex, let's just start with you and, and, and Cassidy Hutchinson. We've talk, talked a lot about her, what she knows, what she could tell us uh, today within this hearing. How much support is she getting? As you're there on the Hill, you're monitoring social media, you're hearing what's happening, these conversations in the hallways. What, what do those particular insiders think about the fact that she is talking? Well, Kira, I can tell you that uh, she is, uh, there is a, 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 an excitement and an anticipation as to what she's going to be testifying about. Uh, we've actually heard from former Deputy White House Press Secretary Sarah Matthews, who tweeted, just want to say how much admiration I have for the tremendous bravery Cassidy Hutchinson is displaying, even in the face of harassment and threats. She is choosing to put her country first and tell the truth. This is what real courage, integrity, and patriotism look like. And this was something that uh, Terry had mentioned before, but, you know, she very well could be significant in the fact that she could potentially connect a lot of the dots, the inner workings that were going inside uh, the, the, the Trump White House, the days leading up to January 6th on that actual day and in the subsequent days after she's an aide. But yes, few people had as much access to the president. His calendar had knowledge of who was coming in and out of his office and also the, dis uh, the discussions that his his chief of staff were having. So, so this could be very, very consequential. So, Elizabeth, why do we keep talking about what Hutchinson told us about these Republicans uh, asking for pardons? Why is that so significant now? And, and what could that testimony from her regarding these five uh, mean? I think it's exactly the connecting the dots point. You know, she connects the dots on a lot of the factual aspects of the conspiracy. You know, the attempts to get the states to change the vote count, the attempts to get the Department of Justice to change uh, the attorney general and get someone in there who would be more willing to back up Trump's false election fraud claims. And then, as I'm sure we'll hear today, the dots on the facts about what happened on January 6th and the willingness to disregard human life up to and including Trump's own vice president she also connects the dots on the people involved in this, from the inner circle, Mark Meadows, Trump, his allies, and these Congress people who were also apparently involved and uh, knew they had done something wrong, and that's why they asked for a pardon. And 
Elizabeth Cassidy Hutchinson has also said in prior testimony that Mark Meadows actually burned documents, burned them in the fireplace. What do you make of that? And could there be any repercussions from this? You know, sometimes in life you think some things are, you know, not black and white, there's a gray area. Burning documents in a fireplace, not a gray area. That is a, a blatant <laughs> disregard for the law, for the Constitution. And, you know, we've seen that time and time again in this story. The blatant disregard for the rule of law, thinking that you are above the law, um, thinking that you can disrupt the peaceful transfer of power in the Constitution in order to retain power. But I think what we're seeing with the January 6th committee is that uh, folks who thought they were above the law might not be, and account accountability could be waiting. All right, Alex, Elizabeth, uh, stay with me, because the January 6th hearing is just moments away. We will have more coverage right after this. This is GMA3, what you need to know. GMA3. A third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon. It's all about you. Lunchtime on ABC. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions. Straightforward reporting. No spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. This season, we're taking it up a level. I'm teaching my celebrity guests survival skills. Your life will depend on it. Then they need to face the wild alone. Bear! And failure is not an option. I'm sure if he's asking me to do it, I can do it, right? And all of a sudden, he's gone. He doesn't even cook your breakfast or anything. Everything's lethal out here. There's no turning back. Oh, God! Oh! Who talked me into this? Running Wild with Bear Grylls. New season, Monday, July 25th at 9 on National Geographic. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Okay. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Steve, Martin, Selena. This week, they're taking a break from solving murders in the building to be on GMA. Fantastic. <laughs> Plus, country music star Jimmy Allen performing for you. This week on Good Morning America. More performances by Dr. Bull. That rocks. He's got the moves that make your animals groove. Let's go. It's a show you won't want to miss. I'm not going to be here forever. Maybe. <laughs> the Incredible Dr. Bull. Saturday, July 16th at 9 on Net Geo Wild. Pictures from the January 6th committee room, the sixth public hearing, a surprise one and an unexpected one. We are told it will focus on newly obtained evidence and testimony. It had been postpone, postponed, but because of the new evidence, particularly from Cassidy Hutchinson, a top aide to Mark Meadows. Uh, as you know, Mark Meadows was former President Donald Trump's chief of staff. During the final months of his presidency, Hutchinson worked side by side with Meadows, basically knowing all the inner workings, conversations, calendar, etc. She knows a lot and apparently has a lot to say. Let's bring in ABC News' Alex Prache, along with our contributors, Amanda Renteria, CEO of Code for America, Barbara Comstock, former Republican Virginia Congresswoman, along with Elizabeth Wydra, president of the Constitutional Constitutional Accountability Center. All right, Alex, what are you hearing from lawmakers? You're there on the Hill. You've been walking the halls. How's the committee preparing for Cassidy Hutchinson? What do you know? Well, you see these live pictures going on right now inside that room, and I will say that within the last hour, there has been a, a spike in anticipation of uh, what Cassidy Hutchinson will be testifying about. We've seen a flurry of tweets. Uh, our colleague John Carl was talking about how uh, today's January 6th committee hearing is going to be big, big, and disturbing. We also saw a tweet from uh, former Deputy White House Press Secretary Sarah Matthews, who said, just wanted to say how much admiration 
I have for the tremendous bravery that Cassidy Hutchinson is displaying even in the face of harassment and threats. She is choosing to put her country first and tell the truth. This is what real courage, integrity, and patriotism looks like. And I, mean, I, I think that, and this was a point that was brought up earlier, uh, the committee is going to try to use Hutchinson's testimony to connect the dots. That's been the big charge for this com uh, this committee all along, to connect the dots, what happened up until January 6th on that day and then subsequently after. And there are few people that have knowledge, few aides that have knowledge uh, and have been willing to testify uh, like Cassidy Hutchinson is today. Barbara, why do you think Cassidy Hutchinson is testifying? Well, because she was there, you know, as the committee went and found people who were there around Mark Meadows that day because he wouldn't cooperate, she was the obvious person. And fortunately, with this new attorney she has, he's somebody who had previously worked at the Justice Department, had worked for Jeff Sessions, um, understood how Donald Trump tried to, and his people tried to intimidate people. So fortunately, she has an attorney who can take her through this process. But she was an obvious choice because this is somebody who saw the day by day, minute by minute, what was going on from, you know, election day and before all the way through January 20th. I mean, some, I think Mark Meadows is in a world of hurt. Let's not forget that he and his wife voted in North Carolina from a trailer park in which all accounts are they did not live. So his, his problems aren't just here. He has, you know, a whole host of problems. And so he was an obvious person to get people around him to talk. And she has um, decided to come forward and be honest about this and has a lot more courage than a lot of these other people who are running for the hills. And I think a lot of members are secretly very happy, Republican members I'm talking about, very happy that this young 20-something-year-old woman has the courage to do what most of them are afraid to. Amanda, do you think she's courageous? Uh, why do you think she is, is decided to talk? Um, because you look at other um, key leaders, including Mark Meadows, um, not talking. Uh, you, you, you wonder, is it because of political aspirations? Is it because of just, you know, CYA? I mean, why do you think she's coming forward and doing this? Do you think it is the lawyer, like Barbara mentioned, that's representing her that used to work for the DOJ? What are the influences here? And because she doesn't have to do this. That's right, she doesn't. But at, at one point or another, you're looking yourself in the mirror and saying, I was there, I knew my job, my job was to coordinate details. My job was to understand what needed to be done to execute on whatever matter came to her desk. And at some point you kind of look yourself in the mirror as a public servant, right? Her name wasn't on the door. Doesn't seem that she has intentions for it to be on the door. And so your job is believing in this institution, believing in the people that you are working for. And when that bond gets broken, and you know it, you know it as a leader, you know it as a staffer, you know it all the way through when your own morality and consciousness is being tested. And what I see here is not simply somebody who was in the room and saw it and it was job was to connect the details, but someone who has the courageous and the respect of those around her, as well as the professional guidance to be able to walk through this moment and do what is right by looking in the mirror and saying, I was there at this moment and I have a responsibility to act as a true public servant who can actually say something and do something about this moment and make sure that other people in the future also know that doing the right thing is still the right thing even when it's hard. And so I know for public servants who are tuning in, this is a moment that really does matter for not only if you're a public servant now, but in the future of what your role is in these moments uh, of history. So Alex, what could she be asked? What could Cassidy be asked that, that would give us a better insight to Meadows and his actions, what he was thinking and what he was doing. Well, Kira, keep in mind that she has already appeared before this committee a number of times, uh, and, 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 and previously she name? has told this committee that, uh, that that Meadows was warned by the former deputy chief of staff of operations uh, that there could be violence on January 6th. So something that she could potentially answer during this hearing was, uh, was Meadows specifically warned about violence towards the vice president? We know that that's been a focus 
uh, of, of some of these committee hearings uh, as of late. Something else uh, she has said, according to transcripts, that Meadows was warned by the White House Counsel Office that the fake electors plot uh, was illegal and proceeded anyway. Is this something that she could provide further context on? Does this further connect the dots uh, of, of the, the, the administration's uh, plots uh, for election fraud? So, Elizabeth, what are you looking at and paying attention to? What do you want to hear? What's the most fascinating part about Cassidy Hutchinson for you? You know, I think her whole story that connects this criminal conspiracy from the fake elector uh, plot to the attempts to cover up you know, and 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 promote the lies about the election um, to the violence that day, and then afterward trying to seek pardons to again kind of cover up for the wrongdoing that had been engaged in. But I also also think it's going to be interesting to see the impact of her testimony on the other players because you know she she may have willingly participated, she may have been advised that she could be subject to a subpoena and uh, perhaps be if she defied that subpoena um, indicted for criminal contempt. That has happened with some of the participants, not with others. But if she's going to be telling the story that um, involves so many of these other big players, they might think again about their refusal to participate in the January 6th committee hearings. You know, we heard Liz Cheney already uh, put out a plea to Pat Cipollone to say, look, come tell your story. But if other people, including Ms. Hutchinson, are telling that story already, it might be in their best interest to come in and speak for themselves. So you think, depending on what she says, it could actually trigger more people to come forward, possibly these five Republicans uh, that have been named that were involved both before, during, after the insurrection, pushing the big lie and having Trump's back with his, his rhetoric. Um, could it even inspire Mark Meadows to finally just decide to come and talk? You know, I think there's a reason why some people invoke the Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination, and that's because they don't have anything to say that could make themselves look less guilty. And I think for folks in that boat, it won't matter. But for folks who think they have a good shot at demonstrating that they aren't guilty, that they aren't implicated in the way that it might seem from other stories, that could right, Elizabeth. Stay with us. Uh, the committee hearing is about to begin. We're going to take it live for our special report and David Muir. Investigation. Now reporting David Muir. Good afternoon. We're coming on the air for the beginning of today's sixth and unscheduled hearing by the January 6th committee. This session not originally on the calendar. It was called roughly 24 hours ago. The committee generating a sense of urgency with this announcement and a lot of speculation over today's hearing. The panel expected to present new evidence and crucial testimony today from a key witness. ABC News learning that former White House aide Cassidy Hutchinson will be testifying before the American people. She was a top aide to former President Trump's former chief of staff, Mark Meadows, an eyewitness inside the West Wing in the days and weeks leading up to the January 6th attack on the Capitol. Of course, as always, our political team standing by, our correspondents, Jonathan Carl, Mary Bruce, Terry Moran, Pierre Thomas, among the team, uh, waiting to weigh in on all this. Cassidy Hutchinson has met with the committee uh, three separate times during lengthy closed door depositions. Her testimony today is the result of months of negotiations. Now, she's expected to provide uh, new insight into Mark Meadows' actions before, during, and after the January 6th assault on the Capitol. She'll also be asked to describe his interactions with the former president. While Trump was pushing false claims of a stolen election, sources telling ABC News during her deposition, Hutchinson confirmed claims about Meadows burning documents in his White House office. You can see her sitting down uh, at the table there in the hearing room. The chairman, Benny Thompson, preparing to gavel in. Meadows, uh, for his part, has not commented on the allegations and is currently in contempt of Congress for defying a subpoena. Uh, let's listen into the room. Cassidy Hutchinson, you can see the uh, still cameras. There are flashes. This is a moment in history. And he gaveled in. The select committee to investigate the January 6th attack on the United States Capitol will be in order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare the committee in recess at any point. Pursuant to House Deposition Authority Regulation 10, the chair announces the committee's approval to release the deposition material presented during this hearing. Good afternoon. In our hearings over the previous weeks, 
The Select Committee has laid out the details of a multi-part pressure campaign driven by the former president aimed at overturning the results of the 2020 presidential election and blocking the transfer of power. We've shown that this effort was based on a lie, a lie that the election was stolen, tainted by widespread fraud, Donald Trump's big lie. In the weeks ahead, the committee will hold additional hearings about how Donald Trump summoned a mob of his supporters to Washington, spurred them to march on the Capitol, and failed to take meaningful action to quell the violence as it was unfolding on January 6th. However, in recent days, the select committee has obtained new information dealing with what was going on in the White House on January 6th and in the days prior. Specific detailed information about what the former president and his top aides were doing and saying in those critical hours. First-hand details of what transpired in the office of the White House Chief of Staff just steps from the Oval Office as the threats of violence became clear and indeed violence ultimately descended on the Capitol in the attack on American democracy. It's, an important, it's important that the American people hear that information immediately. That's why in consultation with the Vice Chair, I've recalled the committee for today's hearing. As you've seen and heard in our earlier hearings, the Select Committee has developed a massive body of evidence thanks to the many hundreds of witnesses who have voluntarily provided information relevant to our investigation. It hasn't always been easy to get that information because the same people who drove the former president's pressure campaign to overturn the election are now trying to cover up the truth about January 6th. But thanks to the courage of certain individuals, the truth won't be buried. The American people won't be left in the dark. Our witness today, Ms. Cassie Hutchinson, has embodied that courage. I won't get into a lot of detail about Ms. Hutchinson's testimony will show. I'll allow her words to speak for themselves. And I hope everyone at home will listen very closely. First, I'll recognize our distinguished vice chair, Ms. Cheney of Wyoming, for any opening statements she'd care to offer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. In our first five hearings, the committee has heard from a significant number of Republicans including former Trump administration Justice Department officials, Trump campaign officials, several members of President Trump's White House staff, a prominent conservative judge, and several others. Today's witness, Ms. Cassidy Hutchinson, is another Republican and another former member of President Trump's White House staff. Certain of us in the House of Representatives recall that Ms. Hutchinson once worked for House Republican Whip Steve Scalise, but she is also a familiar face on Capitol Hill because she held a prominent role in the White House Legislative Affairs Office and later was the principal aide to President Trump's Chief of Staff, Mark Meadows. Ms. Hutchinson has spent considerable time up here on Capitol Hill representing the Trump administration and we welcome her back. Up until now, our hearings have each been organized to address specific elements of President Trump's plan to overturn the 2020 election. Today, we are departing somewhat from that model because Ms. Hutchinson's testimony touches on several important and cross-cutting topics, topics that are relevant to each of our future hearings. In her role working for the White House Chief of Staff, Ms. Hutchinson handled a vast number of sensitive issues. She worked in the West Wing, several steps down the hall from the Oval Office. Ms. Hutchinson spoke daily with members of Congress with high-ranking officials in the administration, with senior White House staff, including Mr. Meadows, with White House counsel lawyers, and with Mr. Tony Ornato, who served as the White House Deputy Chief of Staff. She also worked on a daily basis with members of the Secret Service who were posted in the White House. In short, Ms. Hutchinson was in a position to know a great deal about the happenings in the Trump White House. Ms. Hutchinson has already sat for four videotaped interviews with committee investigators, and we thank her very much for her cooperation and for her courage. We will cover certain 
but not all relevant topics within Ms. Hutchinson's knowledge today. Again, our future hearings will supply greater detail, putting the testimony today in a broader and more complete context. Today, you will hear Ms. Hutchinson relate certain firsthand observations of President Trump's conduct on January 6th. You will also hear new information regarding the actions and statements of Mr. Trump's senior advisors that day, including his chief of staff, Mark Meadows, and his White House counsel. And we will begin to examine evidence bearing on what President Trump and members of the White House staff knew about the prospect for violence on January 6th, even before that violence began. To best communicate the information the committee has gathered, we will follow the practice of our recent hearings, playing videotape testimony from Ms. Hutchinson and others, and also posing questions to Ms. Hutchinson live. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you very much. Our witness today is Ms. Cassie Hutchinson, who served in the Trump administration in the White House Office of Legislative Affairs from 2019 to 2020, and as a special assistant to the president in the White House Chief of Staff's Office from March 2020 through January 2021. I will now swear in our witness. The witness will please stand and raise her right hand. Do you swear or affirm on the penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you, God. Thank you. You may be seated. Let the record reflect the witness answered in the affirmative. I now recognize myself for questions. Ms. Hutchinson, I'd like to start with a few questions about your background. The, the, these are some photographs we've obtained highlighting your career. These show you with members of Congress, including Steve Scalise, as well as the White House with leader Kevin McCarthy and Jim Jordan. Others show you with the president and members of Congress aboard Air Force One. Before you worked in the White House, you worked on Capitol Hill for Representative Steve Scalise, the Republican whip, and Senator Ted Cruz. And then in 2019, you moved to the White House and served there until the end of the Trump administration in 2020. When you started at the White House, you served at, in the Office of Legislative Affairs. We understand that you were initially hired as a staff assistant but was soon promoted to a position of greater responsibility. Can you explain your role for the committee? When I moved over to the White House Chief of Staff's office with Mr. Meadows when he became the fourth Chief of Staff, it's difficult to describe a typical day. Um, I was a special assistant to the president and an advisor to, advisor to the Chief of Staff. The days depended on what the president was doing that day, and that's kind of how my portfolio was reflected. I had a lot of outreach with members of Congress, senior cabinet, cabinet officials. We would work, I would work on policy issues with relevant internal components and members on the Hill, as well as security protocol at the White House complex for Mr. Meadows and the president. And then you, were, you received another promotion in March 2020. At that time, you became the principal aide to the new White House Chief of Staff, Mark Meadows. Is that right? That's correct, sir. What did a typical day look like for you in your work with Mr. Meadows? It varied with what was going on. We spent a lot of time on the Hill. I spent time on the Hill independently, too, as I was his liaison for Capitol Hill. Um, we did a lot of presidential travel engagements. But mostly, I was there to serve what the chief of staff needed. And a lot of times, what the chief of staff needed was a reflection of what the president's schedule is detailed to do that day. So is it fair to say that you spoke regularly in your position, both with members of Congress and with senior members of the Trump administration? That's correct. That's a fair assessment, sir. And would you say that in your work with Mr. Meadows, you are typically in contact with him and others in the White House throughout the day? That's correct, sir. Mr. Meadows and I were in contact almost pretty much throughout every day, um, consistently. 
Although so much of grave importance happens in the West Wing of the White House, it's a quite a small building. Uh, above me on the screen, you can see a map of the first floor of the West Wing of the White House. On the right, you can see the President's Oval Office. On the left, the Chief of Staff's Office Suite. Within the Chief of Staff's Office Suite is the heart of the West Wing, was your desk, which was between the Vice President's Office, Ms. Kirshner's Office, and the Oval Office. Ms. Hutchinson, is this an accurate depiction of where you were located? It's accurate. It's a lot smaller than it looks. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Ms. Hutchinson, this is a photo that shows the short distance between your office and the President's Oval Office. And it only takes five to ten seconds or so to walk down the hall from your office to the Oval Office. Is that right? That's correct. Thank you. Pursuant to the Section 5C8 of House Resolution 503, the chair recognizes Joan Woman from Wyoming, Ms. Cheney, for questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, we uh, will begin today with an exchange that first provided Ms. Hutchinson a tangible sense of the ongoing planning for the events of January 6th. On January 2nd, four days before the attack on our Capitol, President Trump's lead lawyer, Mr. Giuliani, was meeting with White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows and others. Ms. Hutchinson, do you remember Mr. Giuliani meeting with Mr. Meadows on January 2nd, 2021? I do. He met with Mr. Meadows in the evening of January 2nd, 2021. And we understand that you walked Mr. Giuliani out of the White House that night, um, and he talked to you about January 6th. What do you remember him saying? As Mr. Giuliani and I were walking to his vehicles that evening, he looked at me and said something to the effect of, Cass, are you excited for the 6th? It's going to be a great day. I remember looking at him and saying, Rudy, could you explain what's, what's happening on the 6th? Uh, he, he had responded something to the effect of, we're going to the Capitol. It's going to be great. The president's going to be there. He's going to look powerful. He's, he's going to be with the members. He's going to be with the senators. Talk to the chief about it. Talk to the chief about it. He knows about it. And did you go back uh, then up to the West Wing and tell Mr. Meadows about your conversation with Mr. Giuliani? I did. After Mr. Giuliani had left the campus that evening, I went back up to our office and I found Mr. Meadows in his office on the couch. He was scrolling through his phone. I remember leaning against the doorway and saying, I just had an interesting conversation with Rudy, Mark. It sounds like we're going to go to the Capitol. He didn't look up from his phone and said something to the effect of, there's a lot going on, Cass, but I don't know. Things might get real, real bad on January 6th. Uh, Ms. Hutchinson, Mr. Meadows is engaged in litigation with the committee to try to avoid testifying here. Um, what, what was your reaction when he said to you things might get real, real bad? In the days before January 2nd, I was apprehensive about the 6th. I had heard general plans for a rally. Uh, I had heard tentative movements to potentially go to the Capitol. But when hearing Rudy's take on January 6th and then Mark's response, that was the first, that evening was the first moment that I remember feeling scared and nervous for what could happen on January 6th. And I had a deeper concern for what was happening with the planning aspects of it. Thank you, Ms. Hutchinson. Today, we're going to be focusing primarily on the events of January 5th and 6th at the White House. Uh, but to begin and to frame the discussion, I want to uh, talk about a conversation that you had with Mr. John Ratcliffe, the Director of National Intelligence. And uh, you had this conversation in December of 2020. Mr. Ratcliffe was nominated by President Trump uh, to oversee U.S. intelligence, uh, our U.S. intelligence community. Uh, and before his appointment, Mr. Ratcliffe was a Republican member of Congress. As you will see on this clip, Director Ratcliffe's comments in December of 2020 were prescient. 
my understanding was Mr. Rat Director Ratcliffe didn't want much to do with the post-election period. Director Ratcliffe felt that it wasn't something that the White House should be pursuing. It felt it was dangerous for the president's legacy. He had expressed to me that he was concerned that it could spiral out of control and potentially be dangerous, either in, for our democracy or the way that things were going for the six. When you say it wasn't something the White House should be pursuing, what's the it? Trying to fight the results of the election, fighting missing ballots, pressuring filing lawsuits in certain states where there didn't seem to be significant ev evidence and reaching out to state legislatures about that. So pretty much the way that the White House is handling the post-election period, he felt that there could be dangerous repercussions in terms of precedent set for elections, for our democracy, for the six. You know, he was hoping that we would concede. So, Ms. Hutchinson, uh, now we're going to turn to certain information that was available before January 4th and what the Trump administration and the president knew about the potential for violence before January 6th. On the screen, you will see an email received by Acting Deputy Attorney General Donahue on January 4th from the National Security Division of the Department of Justice. Mr. Donahue testified in our hearings last week the email identifies apparent planning by those coming to Washington on January 6th to, quote, occupy federal buildings and discussions of, quote, invading the Capitol building. Here's what Mr. Donahue said to us. And we knew that if you have tens of thousands of very upset people showing up in Washington, D.C., that there was potential for violence. The U.S. Secret Service was looking uh, at similar information and watching the planned demonstrations. In fact, their intelligence division sent several emails to White House personnel, like Deputy Chief of Staff Tony Ornato and the head of the President's protective detail, Robert Engel, including certain materials listing events like those on the screen. The White House continued to receive updates about planned demonstrations, including information regarding the Proud Boys organizing and planning to attend events on January 6th. Although Ms. Hutchinson has no detailed knowledge of any planning involving the Proud Boys for January 6th, she did note this. I recall hearing the word Oath Keeper and hearing the word Proud Boys closer to the planning of the January 6th rally when Mr. Giuliani would be around. On January 3rd, the Capitol Police issued a special event assessment. In that document, the Capitol Police noted that the Proud Boys and other groups planned to be in Washington, D.C. on January 6th and indicated that, quote, unlike previous post-election protests, the targets of the pro-Trump supporters are not necessarily the counter-protesters as they were previously but rather Congress itself is the target on the 6th. Of course, we all know now that the Proud Boys showed up on January 6th, marched from the Washington Monument to the Capitol that day, and led the riotous mob to invade and occupy our Capitol. Ms. Hutchinson, I want to play you a clip of one of our meetings when you described a call on January 4th that you received from National Security Advisor Robert O'Brien on the same topic, potential violence on January 6th. I received a call from Robert O'Brien, the National Security Advisor. He had asked if he could speak with Mr. Meadows about potential violent words of violence that he was hearing that were potentially going to happen on the Hill on January 6th. I had asked if he had connected with Tony Ornato because Tony Ornato had a conversation with him 
with Mark about that topic, Robert had said, I'll, I'll talk to Tony. And then um, you know, I don't know if Robert ever connected with Mark about the issue. Ms. Hutchinson, can you describe for us Mr. Ornato's responsibilities as Deputy Chief of Staff? The Deputy Chief of Staff position at the White House for operations is arguably one of the most important positions that somebody can hold. They're in charge of all security protocol for the campus and all pre presidential protectees, primarily the president and the first family, but anything that requires security for any individual that has uh, presidential protection, so the chief of staff or the um, national security advisor, as well as the vice president's team too. Tony would oversee all of that, and he was the conduit for security protocol between White House staff and the United States Secret Service. Thank you. And you also described a brief meeting between Mr. Ornato and Mr. Meadows on the potential for violence. Uh, the meeting was on January 4th. They were talking about the potential for violence on January 6th. Let's listen to a clip of that testimony. I remember Mr. Ornato had talked to him about intelligence reports. I remember Mr. Ornato coming in and saying that we had intel reports saying that there could potentially be violence on the, on the 6th. You also told us about reports of violence and weapons that the Secret Service were receiving on the night of January 5th and throughout the day on January 6th. Is that correct? That's correct. There are reports that police in Washington, D.C. had arrested several people with firearms or ammunition following a separate pro-Trump rally in Freedom Plaza on the evening of January 5th. Are those some of the reports that you recall hearing about? They are. Of course, the world now knows that the people who attacked the Capitol on January 6th had many different types of weapons. When a president speaks, the Secret Service typically requires those attending to pass through metal detectors, known as magnetometers, or MAGs for short. The Select Committee has learned that people who willingly entered the enclosed area for President Trump's speech were screened so they could attend the rally at the Ellipse. They had weapons and other items that were confiscated. Pepper spray, knives, brass knuckles, tasers, body armor, gas masks, batons, blunt weapons. And those were just from the people who chose to go through the security for the president's event on the ellipse, not the several thousand members of the crowd who refused to go through the mags and watched from the lawn near the Washington Monument. The Select Committee has learned about reports from outside the magnetometers and has obtained police radio transmissions identifying individuals with firearms, including AR-15s, near the ellipse on the morning of January 6th. Let's listen. There's an individual in a tree, maybe a white male, about six feet tall, thin build, brown cowboy boots. He's got blue jeans and a blue jean jacket, and underneath the blue jean jacket, the complainants both saw a stock of an AR-15. He's gonna be with a group of individuals, about five to eight, five to uh, eight other individuals. Two of the individuals in that group at the base of the tree near the porta potties were wearing green fatigues, green olive dress style fatigues, about five eight five nine, skinny, uh, skinny white males, brown cowboy boots. They had Glock style pistols in their waistband. 8736 with the message that subject um, weapon on his right hip. After that, he's in the tree. Motor one, make sure BPD knows they have an elevated threat in the tree south side of Constitution Avenue. Look for the don't tread on me flag, American flag face mask, cowboy boots, weapon on the right, right side hip. I've got three men walking down the street in fatigue carrying AR-15, copy at 14th and Independence. Uh, Motor 2, Motor 2, Motor 2, Motor 2, as you saw in those emails, the first report that we showed, we now know was sent in the eight o'clock hour on January 6th. This talked about people in the crowd wearing ballistic helmets and body armor, carrying radio equipment and military grade backpacks. The second report we showed you on the screen was sent by the Secret Service in the 11 a.m. hour, and it addressed reports of a man with a rifle near the ellipse. 
Ms. Hutchinson, in prior testimony, you described for us a meeting in the White House around 10 a.m. in the morning of January 6th involving Chief of Staff Meadows and Tony Ornato. Were you in that meeting? I was. Let's listen to your testimony about that meeting, and then we'll have some questions. I think the last time we talked, you mentioned that um, some of the weapons that people had at the rally included five poles, oversized um, sticks or flagpoles, uh, bear spray. Is there anything else that you recall hearing about that um, the people who would gather on the ellipse had? I recall Tony and I having a conversation with Mark probably around 10 a.m., 10, 15 a.m., where I remember Tony mentioning knives, guns in the form of pistols and rifles, um, bear spray, body armor, spears, and flagpoles. Spears were one item, flagpoles were one item, and then Tony had relayed to me something to the effect of, and these effing people are fastening spears onto the ends of flagpoles. And Ms. Hutchinson, here's a clip of your testimony regarding Mr. Meadows' response to learning that the rally attendees were armed that day. What was Mark's reaction, Mr. Meadows' reaction, to this list of weapons that people had in the crowd? When Tony and I went in to talk to Mark that morning, Mark was sitting on his couch and on his phone, which was something typical. And I remember Tony just got right into it. I was like, sorry, I just want to let you know, and had informed him, like, this is how many people we have outside the mags right now. These are the weapons that we're known to have. It's possible he listed more weapons off that I just don't recall. Um, and gave him a brief but and concise explanation, but also fairly fairly thorough. And I remember distinctly Mark not looking up from his phone. And I, I remember Tony finishing his explanation and it taking a few seconds for Mark to say something to the point where I almost said, Mark, did you hear him? Um, and then Mark chimed in and was like, all right, anything else? Still looking down at his phone. And Tony looked at me and I looked at Tony and I, he, Tony said, no, sir, do you have any questions? He's like, what are you hearing? And I looked at Tony and I was like, sir, he just told you about what was happening down at the rallies. And he was like, yeah, yeah, I know. And then he looked up and said, have you talked to the president? And Tony said, yes, sir, he's aware too. He said, all right, good. He asked Tony if Tony had informed the president. Yes. And Tony said, yes, he had. So Ms. Hutchinson, is it your understanding that Mr. Ornato told the president about weapons at the rally on the morning of January 6th? That's what Mr. Renato relayed to me. And here's how you characterize Mr. Meadows' general response when people raised concerns about what could happen on January 6th. So at the time in the days leading up to the 6th, there were lots of public reports about how things might go bad on the 6th, and even the potential for violence. If I'm hearing you correctly, what stands out to you is that Mr. Meadows did not share those concerns, or at least did not act on those concerns. Did not act on those concerns would be accurate. But other people raised them to, to him? Like in this exchange, you mentioned that Mr. Arnado pulled him aside. That's correct. Ms. Hutchinson, we're going to show now an exchange of texts between you and Deputy Chief of Staff Arnado. Um, and these text messages uh, were uh, exchanged while you were at the ellipse. Um, in one text, uh, you write, but the crowd looks good from this vantage point as long as we get the shot. He was effing furious. And the text messages also stress that President Trump kept mentioning the OTR, an off-the-record movement. We're going to come back and ask you about that in a minute. But could you tell us, first of all, who it is in the text who was furious? The he in that text that I was referring to was the president. And uh, why was he furious, Ms. Hutchinson? He was furious because he wanted the arena that we had on the ellipse to be maxed out at capacity for uh, all attendees. The advance team had relayed to him that the mags were free flowing. Everybody who wanted to come in had already come in, but he still was angry about the extra space and wanted more people to come in. 
And did you go to the rally in the presidential motorcade? I, I was there, yes, in the motorcade. And were you backstage uh, with the president and other members of his staff and family? I was. And you told us, Ms. Hutchinson, about particular comments that you heard while you were in the tent area. When we were in the offstage announce area tent behind the stage, he was very concerned about the shot, meaning the photograph that we would get because the rally space wasn't full. Um, one of the reasons, which I've previously stated, was because he wanted it to be full and for people to not feel excluded because they'd come far to watch him at the rally. Um, and he felt the mags were at fault for not letting everybody in. But another leading reason, and likely the primary reason, is because he wanted it full and he was angry that we weren't letting people through the mags with weapons, what the Secret Service deemed as weapons and our, our weapons. <laughs> but when we were in the offstage announced tent, I was part of a conversation. I was in the I was in the vicinity of a conversation where I overheard the president say something to the effect of, "You know, I, I don't effing care that they have weapons. They're not here to hurt me. Take the effing mags away. Let my people in. They can march to the Capitol from here. Let the people in. Take the effing mags away." Just to be clear, Ms. Hutchinson, is it your understanding that the president wanted? to take the mags away and said that the armed individuals were not there to hurt him. That's a fair assessment. The issue wasn't with the amount of space available in the official rally area uh, only, but instead that people did not want to have to go through the mags. Let's listen to a portion of what you told us about that. In this particular instance, it wasn't the capacity of our space. It was the mags and the people that didn't want to come through. And that's what Tony had been trying to relay to him that morning. You know, it's not the issues that we encountered on the campaign. We have enough space, sir. They don't want to come in right now. They they have weapons that they don't want confiscated by the Secret Service. And they're fine on the mall. They can see you on the mall. And they're, they want to march straight to the Capitol from the mall. The president apparently wanted all attendees inside the official rally space and repeatedly said, quote, they're not here to hurt me. And, and just to, to be clear, so um, he was told again in that conversation, or was he told again in that conversation that people couldn't come through the mags because they had weapons? Correct. And um, that people, and he, his response was to say they can march to the Capitol from, in, from the ellipse. Something to the effect of take the effing mags away, they're not here to hurt me, let them in, let my people in. They can march to the Capitol after the rally's over. They can march from they can march from the ellipse. Take the effing mags away. Then they can march to the Capitol. Ms. Hutchinson, what we saw when those clips were playing were photos provided by the National Archives showing the president in the offstage tent before his speech on the ellipse. You were in some of those photos as well. And uh, I just want to confirm that that is when you heard the president say the people with weapons weren't there to hurt him and that he wanted the Secret Service to remove the magnetometers. That's correct. In the photos that you displayed, we were standing towards the front of the tent with the TVs really close to where he would walk out to go onto the stage. These conversations happened two to three minutes before he took the stage that morning. Let's reflect on that for a moment. President Trump was aware that a number of the individuals in the crowd had weapons and were wearing body armor. And here's what President Trump instructed the crowd to do. We're gonna walk down and I'll be there with you. We're gonna walk down. We're gonna walk down anyone you want, but I think right here, we're gonna walk down to the Capitol. And the crowd, as we know, did proceed to the Capitol. It soon became apparent to the Secret Service, including the Secret Service teams in the crowd, along with White House staff, that security at the Capitol would not be sufficient. I had two or three phone conversations with Mr. Renato when we were at the Ellipse, and then I had four men on Mr. Meadows' detail with me in between 
those individuals and then a few other bodies on the ground, just the Secret Service doing advance, they were getting notifications through their radios. And Mr. Ordano in one phone conversation had called me and said, make sure the chief knows that they're, they're getting close to the Capitol. It's, um, they're having trouble stacking bodies. And Ms. Hutchinson, when you, you said they were having trouble stacking bodies, did you mean that law enforcement at the Capitol uh, needed more people to defend the Capitol from the rioters? It was becoming clear to us and to the Secret Service that Capitol Police officers were getting overrun at the security barricades outside of the Capitol building, and they were having short, they were short people to defend the building against the rioters. And uh, you mentioned that Mr. Ornato was conveying this to you because he wanted you to tell Mr. Meadows. Uh, so did you, did you tell Mr. Meadows uh, that people were getting closer to the Capitol and that Capitol Police was having challenge, difficulty? After I had the conversation with Mr. Meadows, Mr. after I had the conversation with Mr. Ornato, I went to have the discussion with Mr. Meadows. He was in a secure vehicle at the time making a call. So when I had gone over to the car, I went to open the door to let him know, and he had immediately shut it. I don't know who he was speaking with. Um, it wasn't something that he regularly did, especially when I would go over to give him information. So I was a bit taken aback, but I didn't think much of it, and thinking that I was, would be able to have the conversation with him a few moments later. And were you able to have that conversation a few moments later? Probably about 20 to 25 minutes later, there was another period in between where he shut the door again. Um, and then when he finally got out of the vehicle, we had the conversation. But at that point, there was a backlog of information that he should have been made aware of. And so you opened the door to the control car and Mr. Meadows pulled it shut? That's correct. And he did that two times? That's correct. And when you finally were able to give Mr. Meadows the information um, about the violence at the Capitol, what was his reaction? He almost had a lack of reaction. I remember him saying, all right, something to the effect of, how much longer ha is, does the president have left in his speech? Again, uh, much of this information about the potential for violence um, was known or learned before the onset of the violence, early enough for President Trump to take steps to prevent it. He could, for example, have urged the crowd at the Ellipse not to march to the Capitol. He could have condemned the violence immediately once it began, or he could have taken multiple other steps. But as we will see today and in later hearings, President Trump had something else in mind. One other question at this point, Ms. Hutchinson, were you aware of concerns that White House counsel Pat Cipollone or Eric Hirschman had about the language President Trump used in his Ellipse speech? There were many discussions the morning of the 6th about the rhetoric of the speech that day. In my conversations with Mr. Hirschman, he had relayed that we would be foolish to include language that had been included at the president's request, which had lines along to the effect of fight for Trump, we're going to march to the Capitol, I'll be there with you fight for me, fight for what we're doing, fight for the movement, um, things about the vice president at the time, too. Both Mr. Hirschman and White House Counsel's Office were urging the speechwriters to not include that language for legal concerns and also for the op optics of what it could portray the president wanting to do that day. And we just heard the president say that he would be with his supporters as they marched to the Capitol even though uh, he did not end up going, he certainly wanted to. Um, some have questioned whether President Trump genuinely planned to come here to the Capitol on January 6th. In his book, Mark Meadows falsely wrote that after President Trump gave his speech on January 6th, he told Mr. Meadows that he was, quote, speeding meta speaking metaphorically about the walk to the Capitol. As you will see, Donald Trump was not speaking metaphorically. As we heard earlier, Rudy Giuliani told Ms. Hutchinson that Mr. Trump plans to travel to the Capitol on January 6th. 
I want to pause for just a moment uh, to ask you, Ms. Hutchinson, to explain some of the terminology you will hear today. We've heard you use two different terms to describe plans for the president's movement to the Capitol or anywhere else. One of those is a scheduled movement, and another one is OTR. Could you describe for us what each of those mean? A scheduled presidential movement is on his official schedule. It's notified to the press and to a wide range of staff that will be traveling with him. It's known to the public, known to the Secret Service, and they're able to coordinate the movement days in advance. An off-the-record movement is confined to the knowledge of a very, very small group of advisors and staff. Typically, a very small group of staff would travel with him, mostly that are just included in the national security package. You can pull an off-the-record off movement together in less than an hour. Um, it's a way to kind of circumvent having to release it to the press, if that's the goal of it, or to not have to have as many security parameters put in place ahead of time to make the movement happen. Thank you. And let's turn back now to the president's plans to travel to the Capitol on January 6th. We know that White House counsel Pat Cipollone was concerned about the legal implications of such a trip. And he agreed with the Secret Service that it shouldn't happen. Ms. Hutchinson, did you have any conversations with Pat Cipollone about his concerns about the president going to the Capitol on January 6th? On January 3rd, Mr. Cipollone had approached me knowing that Mark had raised the prospect of going up to the Capitol on January 6th. Mr. Cipollone and I had a brief private conversation where he said to me, we need to make sure that this doesn't happen. This would be a legally a, a terrible idea for us. We're, we have serious legal concerns if we go up to the Capitol that day. And he then urged me to continue relaying that to Mr. Meadows because it's my understanding that Mr. Cipollone thought that Mr. Meadows was indeed pushing this along with the president. And we understand, Ms. Hutchinson, that you also spoke to Mr. Cipollone on the morning of the 6th as you were about to go to the rally on the ellipse. And Mr. Cipollone said something to you like, make sure the movement to the Capitol does not happen. Is that correct? That's correct. I saw Mr. Cipollone right before I walked out onto West Exec that morning. And Mr. Cipollone said something to the effect of, please make sure we don't go up to the Capitol, Cassidy. Keep in touch with me. We're going to get charged with every crime imaginable if we make that movement happen. And do you remember which crimes Mr. Cipollone was concerned with? In the days leading up to the 6, we had conversations about potentially obstructing justice or defrauding the electoral count. Let's hear uh, about some of those concerns uh, that you mentioned earlier uh, in one of your interviews with us. Having a private conversation with Pat late in the afternoon of the 3rd or the 4th. Um, that Pat was concerned it would look like we were obstructing justice or obstructing the electoral college count. And I, I apologize for probably not being so um, <laughs> very firm with my legal terms here. <laughs> but um, that it would look like we were obstructing what was happening on Capitol Hill. And he was also worried that it would look like we were inciting a riot or encouraging a riot to erupt on the Capitol, at the Capitol. In fact, in the days before January 6th and on January 6th itself, President Trump expressed to multiple White House aides that he wanted to go to the Capitol after his speech. Here's what various White House aides have told the committee about the president's desire to go to the Capitol. Did the president tell you this, that he wanted to speak at the Capitol? Correct, yes. During the meeting in the dining room, did the, the idea of the president um, proceeding or walking to the Capitol on the 6th after his speech come up? Walking to the Capitol? No. Driving to the Capitol? It came up. Okay, how did it come up and what was discussed? He brought it up. He said, I want to go down to the Capitol. What about him marching to the Capitol on the 6th? Um, yes. Tell us about that. So... 
it's kind of a general thing. I mean, to get into the specifics of it, I, I was aware of the desire of the president to potentially uh, march to the uh, or, or accompany the um, rally attendees to the Capitol. When did you first hear about this idea of the president accompanying rally attendees to the Capitol on the 6th? Well, this was at the 6th. This was during the, um, after he finished his remarks. When the president said that he would be going to the Capitol during his speech on the ellipse, the Secret Service scrambled to find a way for him to go. We know this from witnesses and the Secret Service, also from messages among staff on the president's National Security Council. The NSC staff were monitoring the situation in real time, and you can see how the situation evolved in the following chat log that the committee has obtained. As you can see, NSC staff believed that Mogul, the president, was, quote, going to the Capitol, and, quote, they are finding the best route now. From these chats, we also know the staff learned of the attack on the Capitol in real time. When President Trump left the ellipse stage at 1.10, the staff knew that rioters had invaded the inaugural stage and Capitol Police were calling for all available officers to respond. When Republican leader Kevin McCarthy heard the president say he was going to the Capitol, he called you, Ms. Hutchinson. Isn't that right? That's correct. And in this text message, you told Tony Ornato, quote, McCarthy just called me too. And do you guys think you're coming to my office? Tell us about the call that day with Leader McCarthy during the president's speech on the ellipse. I was still in the tent behind the stage. And when you're behind the stage, you, you can't really hear what's going on in front of you. So when Mr. McCarthy called me with this information, he, I answered the call and he sounded a rush, but also frustrated and angry at me. And I, I was confused because I, I didn't know what the president had just said. Um, he then explained, the president just said he's marching to the Capitol. You told me this whole week, you aren't coming up here. Why would you lie to me? I said, I'm, I'm not lying. I, I wasn't lying to you, sir. I, we're not going to the Capitol. And he said, well, he just said it on stage, Cassidy. Figure it out. Don't come up here. I said, I'll, I'll, I'll run the traps on this and I'll shoot you a text. I, I can assure you we're not coming up to the Capitol. We've already made that decision. He pressed a little bit more, believing me, but I think frustrated that the president had said that. And we ended the phone conversation after that. I called Mr. Renato to reconfirm that we weren't going to the Capitol, and which is also in our text messages. I sent Mr. McCarthy another text telling him the affirmative that we were not going up to the Capitol, and he didn't respond after that. And we understand, Ms. Hutchinson, that the plans for the president to come up to the Capitol um, had included discussions at some point about uh, what the president would do when he came up to the Capitol on January 6th. Uh, let's look at a clip that, a, of one of your interviews discussing that issue with the committee. When you were talking about a scheduled movement, did um, anyone say what the president wanted to do when he got here? No. Not that I can specifically remember. I remember I remember hearing a few different ideas discussed with between the Mark and Scott Perry, Mark and Rudy Giuliani. I don't know which conversations were elevated to the president. I don't know what he personally wanted to do when he went up to the Capitol that day. Um, you know, I, I know that there were discussions about him having another speech outside of the Capitol before going in. I know that there was a conversation about him going into the House chamber at one point. As we've all just heard, in the days leading up to January 6th, on the day of the speech, both before and during and after the rally speech, President Trump was pushing his staff to arrange for him 
to come up here to the Capitol during the electoral vote count. Let's turn now to what happened in the President's vehicle when the Secret Service told him he would not be going to the Capitol after his speech. First, here is the President's motorcade leaving the ellipse after his speech on January 6th. Ms. Hutchinson, when you returned to the White House in the motorcade after the President's speech, where did you go? When I returned to the White House, I walked upstairs towards the Chief of Staff's office, and I noticed Mr. Renato lingering outside of the office. Once we had made eye contact, he quickly waved me to go into his office, which was just across the hall from mine. When I went in, he shut the door, and I noticed Bobby Angle, who is the head of Mr. Trump's security detail, sitting in a chair, just looking somewhat discombobulated and a little lost. Um, and I, I looked at Tony, and he had said, did you effing hear what happened in the Beast? I said, no, Tony, I, I just got back. What happened? Tony proceeded to tell me that when the President got in the Beast, he was under the impression from Mr. Meadows that the off-the-record movement to the Capitol was still possible and likely to happen, but that Bobby had more information. So once the President had gotten into the vehicle with Bobby, he thought that they were going up to the Capitol, and when Bobby had relayed to him, we're not, we don't have the assets to do it, it's not secure, we're going back to the West Wing. The President had very strong, a very angry response to that. Um, Tony described him as being irate. The President said something to the effect of, I'm the effing President, take me up to the Capitol now. To which Bobby responded, sir, we have to go back to the West Wing. The President reached up towards the front of the vehicle to grab at the steering wheel. Mr. Engel grabbed his arm, said, sir, you need to take your hand off the steering wheel. We're going back to the West Wing. We're not going to the Capitol. Mr. Trump then used his free hand to lunge towards Bobby Angle. And Mr. when Mr. Renato had recounted this story to me, he had motioned towards his clavicles. And was Mr. Angle in the room as Mr. Renato told you this story? He was. Did Mr. Angle correct or disagree with any part of the story for Mr. Ornato? Mr. Engel did not correct or disagree with any part of the story. Did Mr. Engel or Mr. Ornato ever after that tell you that what Mr. Ornato had just said was untrue? N neither Mr. Ornato nor Mr. Engel told me ever that it was untrue. And despite this altercation, this physical altercation, uh, during the ride back to the White House, President Trump still demanded to go to the Capitol. Here's what Kaylee McEnany, the White House press secretary at the time, wrote in her personal notes and told the committee about President Trump's desire to go to the Capitol after returning to the White House. When you wrote, POTUS wanted to walk to the Capitol, was that based solely on what the president said during his speech or anything that he or anybody else said afterwards? So to the best of my recollection, I believe when we got back to the White House, he said he wanted to physically walk with the marchers. And according to my notes, he then said uh, he'd be fine with just writing the piece. But to the best of my recollection, he wanted to be a part of the march in some fashion. Okay, and just for the record, the beast refers to the presidential limousine? Yes. President Trump did not go to the Capitol that day. We understand that he blamed Mark Meadows for that. So prior to leaving the rally site, when he got off the stage and everybody was making the movement back to the motorcade, I had overheard Mr. Meadows say to him then, as I had prior to Mr. Trump taking the stage that morning, um, that he was still working on getting an off-the-record movement to the Capitol. So when Mr. Trump took the stage, he was under the impression by Mr. Meadows that 
it was still possible. So when he got off the stage, I had relayed to Mr. Meadows that I had another conversation with Tony. The movement was still not possible. Mr. Meadows said, okay. And then as they proceeded to go to the motorcade, um, and Mr. Meadows had reiterated, we're gonna work on it. So I talked to Bobby. Bobby has more information. Mark got into his vehicle, to my understanding. Trump got into the beast. And after we had all arrived back at the White House, later in the day, it had been relayed to me via Mark that the president wasn't happy that Bobby didn't pull it off for him and that Mark didn't work hard enough to get the movement on the books. The physical altercation that Ms. Hutchinson described in the presidential vehicle was not the first time that the president had become very angry about issues relating to the election. On December 1, 2020, Attorney General Barr said in an interview that the Department of Justice had not found evidence of widespread election fraud sufficient to change the outcome of the election. Ms. Hutchinson, how did the president react to hearing that news? Around the time that I understand the AP article went live, I remember hearing noise coming from down the hallway, so I poked my head out of the office, and I saw the valet walking towards our office. He had said, get the chief down to the dining room. The president wants him. So Mark went down to the dining room and came back to the office a few minutes later. After Mark had returned, I left the office and went down to the dining room, and I noticed that the door was propped open, and the valet was inside the dining room changing the tablecloth off of the dining room table. He motioned for me to come in and then pointed towards the front of the room near the fireplace mantle and the TV where I first noticed there was ketchup dripping down the wall and there's a shattered porcelain plate on the floor. The valet had articulated that the president was extremely angry at the attorney general's AP interview and had thrown his lunch against the wall. Um, which was causing them to have to clean up. So I, I grabbed a towel and started wiping the ketchup off of the wall to help the valet out. Um, and he said something to the effect of, he's really ticked off about this. I, I would stay clear of him for right now. He, he's really, really ticked off about this right now. And Ms. Hutchinson, was this the only instance that you are aware of where the president threw dishes? It's not. And are there other instances in the dining room that you recall where he expressed his anger? There were, there were several times throughout my tenure with the chief of staff that I was aware of him either throwing dishes or flipping the tablecloth um, to let all the contents of the table go onto the floor and likely break or go everywhere. And Ms. Hutchinson, Attorney General Barr described to the committee the president's angry reaction when he finally met with President Trump. Let's listen. And uh, I said, look, I, I uh, know that you're dissatisfied with me and I'm glad to offer my resignation. And he pounded the table very hard. Everyone sort of jumped and he said, accept it. Mr. Chairman, I reserve. Tim Woman reserves. The chair requests those in the hearing room to remain seated until the Capitol Police have escorted our witness from the room. Pursuant to the order of the committee of today, the chair declares the committee in recess for a period of approximately 10 minutes. The American people uh, witnessing, uh, hearing extraordinary testimony from uh, that young woman there, Cassidy Hutchinson, a White House aide who worked directly with former White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows, uh, in addition to a number of other posts before she uh, was assigned to that role. Uh, they showed very early on just how close she was to former President Trump physically uh, in the West Wing of the White House, just steps away. Uh, from the Oval, how much she witnessed in the weeks uh, leading up to January 6th, and in particular in the final days before January 6th. And of particular note, her description of January 6th itself, being down at the Ellipse for the speech from former President Trump, 
uh, witnessing what she described was the the anger from the president that the crowd was not full in that area. She testified before the American people under oath today that the president uh, repeatedly said, get rid of the mags. Of course, that's short for uh, the security there, uh, checking for weapons. He said it does not matter. Uh, in so many words, she said that there are weapons, uh, that the former president said, they're not here for me, uh, in so many words. He repeatedly said, let them in, uh, so that the crowd would be larger uh, for that speech. She then testified before the American people that the president did, in fact, want to travel to the Capitol that day, even after uh, the White House chief of staff and others surrounding the former president had been told that it had already turned violent at the Capitol, that the president did want to make that trip in the beast, uh, as it's called, the White House motorcade, of course. That's the car that the president travels in. Uh, she describes uh, the Secret Service uh, detail assigned to the president, telling him, Mr. President, we cannot secure uh, that route, that trip, uh, which was off the record, off the official schedule, uh, that the security would not allow for that trip, given uh, the uncertainty uh, and the chaos that was already unfolding. She testified again, under oath in front of the American people, uh, the president's response in the motorcade, in the beast, uh, that he was furious with the agent who told him this information, that he actually reached for the steering wheel uh, at one point uh, in this exchange after being told this would not happen. Uh, Mr. President, we are taking you uh, back to the White House. I want to bring in our chief Washington correspondent, Jonathan Carl, because, uh, John, uh, no other word to describe this other than simply extraordinary. David, Cassidy Hutchinson is 25 years old. She had a desk right in the middle of the West Wing, between the Chief of Staff's office uh, and the Oval Office. She was there, she was present for all of this. And that testimony that we just heard described, essentially, a president who wanted to personally oversee an all-out coup on January 6th. Disregard for the violence, disregard for the law, wanted to go there, wanted to march up to the Capitol to be there to prevent what was happening on January 6th, which was the certification of an election that would have removed him, that did remove him from power. Uh, stopped ultimately in one way by the Secret Service itself, who knew that it was going to be dangerous at the very least. And hearing her testify, hearing in real time from the president's lead Secret Service agent, Antonio Arnato, the deputy chief of staff, who himself is a former and now again a Secret Service agent, uh, describing that scene in the presidential limo of the president lunging at his own Secret Service agent, refusing, after he refused uh, to take him with all those marchers up to the Capitol. This, this is uh, a new level in these hearings, David. Uh, we've heard a lot of really compelling testimony over, over the previous uh, five hearings, uh, but we've heard nothing like this. Uh, it's astounding, it's revelatory, it's compelling. Uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a portrait of a president that was entirely out of control and doing everything he could possibly do to remain in power. And John, just to underscore what you've just described, Cassidy Hutchinson testifying before the American people uh, in so many words saying the president said while traveling in the motorcade, I am the blank president. You're going to listen to what I'm telling you. We are going to the Capitol. Uh, the agent reiterating, it's not safe, sir. We're bringing you back to the White House and that's final. Testifying that the former president then lunged forward into what I believe would be the cab of the presidential limo and yes. went to grab the steering wheel. Uh, the former president, again, was extremely angry at that response and then used his free hand uh, to lunge at Bobby Engel, and that's the agent that John Carl just mentioned who was charged with uh, protecting the former president on that day. Cassidy Hutchinson then describing John when she got back to the White House to the West Wing and we saw, we all know how small the West Wing is, but I thought that was somewhat telling for the American people to show it and even the model made it look larger than it actually is. She gets back to the West Wing, heads to the uh, former chief of staff's office and there are a couple of people gathered outside the door. Um, the exhaustion she describes on their faces, uh, the disbelief 
of what they had just witnessed from the president in the motorcade. She said the conversation began, John, with the simple question, did you blank hear what just happened in the beast? And there's more to come, uh, David. Uh, this testimony is going to resume here in, in a few minutes. What we heard in dramatic and vivid detail was what was going on in the lead up to the assault on the Capitol. Uh, now I'm, I'm, I'm sure the, the conversation is going to turn to what else she witnessed that day while the attack on the Capitol was underway. I'll tell you, I just, just, just take a moment for a second and uh, admire the courage and the bravery of this 25-year-old, only a few, couple years uh, removed from being an intern on Capitol Hill and then an intern uh, uh, in the White House, uh, and then to the position she ultimately had on January 6th, which was the principal aide to the White House chief of staff, uh, for her to do what so many other uh, officials in that White House have refused to do. Uh, which is to come forward and to testify honestly and clearly uh, about what she witnessed. Uh, before today, I, I venture that very few Americans had ever heard the name Cassidy Hutchinson. Uh, after today, I, I, that will not be the case. This is, this is a, a very brave uh, young woman who witnessed extraordinary events inside the White House uh, and has now come forward to tell the world about what she saw. John Carl, with us as always. John, uh, I thank you for that. I want to bring in Mary Bruce, of course, our senior White House correspondent covering the current administration. But before this role, she covered Congress for many years, um, would often chase members of Congress down the hall to get answers. Uh, and Mary, you well know that Cassidy Hutchinson was uh, greatly respected. She worked for several leaders in the House, Republican leaders. Uh, she was a legislative liaison between the Trump White House uh, and Congress. She worked up uh, in the West Wing very quickly to this role for Mark Meadows, the chief of staff. And that happened because there was so much respect for her that she would uh, do her job. She described today in front of the American people that they were very long days and often those days were dictated by what the former president wanted to accomplish on a particular day. And for her to go before the American people today, this is not what, uh, you know, the former president would dub a never Trumper. She was a full supporter of former President Trump during his time as in office and of the policies coming out of the White House. But she has made the decision to go public with what she witnessed um, and her unease in the days leading up to January 6th. She testified today that a number of people inside that White House knew in the days leading up to January 6th that this could be uh, dangerous. And she said the first time she was scared, I believe was the word she used, was after a conversation with Rudy Giuliani when he had been at the White House just a couple of days before January 6th. They were walking out of the White House and he asked her, are you excited uh, for January 6th? And David, she says that when she relayed that conversation to her boss, who she worked loyally for for many years, Mark Meadows, without looking up, he said, yeah, it could get, quote, real, real bad on January 6th. That was just uh, four days beforehand. And that's the beginning of this, right? It is very clear from everything that Cassidy Hutchinson has said today that those inside the White House and the president himself knew of the massive risk, knew of the real danger that his supporters could pose to those at the Capitol to each other, to members of the public, and the president, as she is outlining, simply didn't care because, as he put it, according to her, they weren't a risk to him. And it is astounding to hear her outline all of this and to recognize that no one was willing to stand up, really, to Donald Trump. And first and foremost, you would think that that would be Mark Meadows' job. He is the chief of staff. Mark Meadows, I covered him for many years on Capitol Hill. He is known as someone in Washington who's willing to tell anyone what they want to hear. And first and foremost, that was very very true of Donald Trump. It was true when Mark Meadows was a congressman. It was true, of course, when he was in the White House. And it seems uh, throughout the day on January 6th, not even uh, wanting to really tell the president that he couldn't make that movement up to the Capitol for his own safety. Uh, and Mark Meadows is someone, you know, he's the president's right-hand man. He is there with Donald Trump through every step of this and is someone uh, whose job description it is, essentially, to, to advise the president first and foremost. Uh, and you would imagine that that would extend especially to the president own safety to the safety of Americans and all of that was disregarded and David lastly it has been said but it has to be said again the courage 
that Cassidy Hutchinson is showing, given her loyalty to Mark Meadows, her loyalty to Donald Trump, which she is so publicly breaking today in order to do this, and she is putting herself at huge risk and yet willing to do it because she believes that this is the right thing for this country. She is 20 five years old. Let that sink in. It is just astounding, David. It really is. And just to underscore, quick follow to you, Mary, because you, you, were, you were making the point that a number of people knew of the dangers leading up to January 6th. She made that very clear today. But what they did today was they went a step further. They showed the text messages, the phone logs over the course of that morning on January 6th, making it very clear that the White House team closest to the former president knew that some of this violence was underway, that this had begun to unfold at the Capitol, that they knew that this was uh, happening, and that the president still wanted to go to the Capitol. Uh, and this was after you just pointed out, he said at the ellipse, let them in anyway. These, these weapons, they're not here to hurt me. They're not after me, let them in. That the former president wanted to go up to the Capitol despite the knowledge of his inner circle that the chaos had begun to unfold at the Capitol. That the president wanted to be there. The president wanted to be there no matter what, and it seemed nothing was going to stop him. I mean, he physically got in an altercation with his own security, according to Hutchinson. That is how intent he was on doing this, regardless of the outcome, despite the fact that he knew that many of his supporters were armed quite literally uh, with weapons of war. They were going into battle. Uh, tear gas, pepper spray, blunt objects, spears. He knew, or could foresee certainly, what was to come, and it didn't matter, it seems. That is the argument that, that Hutchinson is outlaying, outlying here. And I keep thinking about how she described, you know, when Mark Meadows was told that, that law enforcement on the Capitol was having trouble, essentially, as they interacted with the crowd. And she says that Meadows had, had almost a complete lack of reaction, because I'm sure they knew well uh, that nothing was going to stop Donald Trump. Mary Bruce at the White House, and of course, Mary uh, pulling from her reporting for many years of Capitol Hill and of many of these key players, uh, former members of Congress, current members of Congress. I want to bring in Sarah Isger, former spokesperson of the Trump Department of Justice, of course, now an ABC News contributor. And Sarah, just first off, your reaction to what you've heard from Cassidy Hutchinson today. Well, I won't be surprised at this point if Mark Meadows decides to plead the fifth. Several of the things that Ms. Hutchison was talking about could very well be felonies, and I expect we're going to hear more from her this afternoon, including about potential destruction of documents by the former chief of staff. You know, this, to me, was a perfect example of why Kevin McCarthy should have put Republicans who disagreed with this narrative, who wanted to defend the president, because right now we are getting one side of the story from a Trump loyal former official. As you said, this isn't a never Trumper. And she is painting a bleak picture of what was happening at the White House that day. And I do have to ask you, when you say one side of the story, I mean, are, are you questioning that what she is saying today is not a factual? Because if the, the facts are telling the story of the day, then, then that is the story of the day. That's exactly right. But, you know, Republicans had the opportunity to have members on this committee who could push back, who could ask questions or present an alternative. We're not hearing that potentially because there isn't another side of the story. But Donald Trump has attacked Kevin McCarthy for not putting members. He said it was a mistake. And I think we're seeing why today, because right now what we're hearing from is a loyal former Trump official who, again, we are taking now her statements as fact because no one is presenting an alternative or questioning her credibility. Uh, for very good reason. Sarah Isker, former spokesperson of the Trump Department of Justice, and Sarah points out that this is a, a loyal former member of the Trump administration, Cassidy Hutchinson, who has gone before the American people, particularly damning testimony today, given her loyalty. The committee will be in order. They've gaveled back in. Chair recognizes a gentlewoman from Wyoming, Vice Chair Cheney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before we turn to what Ms. Hutchinson saw and heard in the White House during the violent attack on the Capitol on January 6th, let's discuss certain communications White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows had on January 5th. President Trump's associate, Roger Stone, attended rallies during the afternoon and the evening of January 5th in Washington, D.C. On January 5th and 6th, Mr. Stone was photographed with multiple members of the Oath Keepers who were allegedly serving as his security detail. As we now know, multiple members of that organization have been charged with or pled guilty to crimes associated with January 6th. 
Mr. Stone has invoked his Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination before this committee. General Michael Flynn has also taken the Fifth before this committee. Mr. Stone previously had been convicted of other federal crimes unrelated to January 6th. General Flynn had pleaded guilty to a felony charge also predating and unrelated to January 6th. President Trump pardoned General Flynn just weeks after the presidential election. And in July of 2020, he commuted the sentence Roger Stone was to serve. The night before January 6th, President Trump instructed his chief of staff, Mark Meadows, to contact both Roger Stone and Michael Flynn regarding what would play out the next day. Ms. Hutchinson, is it your understanding that President Trump asked Mark Meadows to speak with Roger Stone and General Flynn on January 5th? That's correct. That is my understanding. And Ms. Hutchinson, is it your understanding that Mr. Meadows called Mr. Stone on the 5th? I'm under the impression that Mr. Meadows did complete both a call to Mr. Stone and General Flynn the evening of the 5th. And do you know what they talked about that evening, Ms. Hutchinson? I'm not sure. Is it your understanding that Mr. Giuliani, Mr. Eastman, and others had set up what has been called, quote, a war room at the Willard Hotel on the night of the 5th? I was aware of that the night of the 5th. And do you know if Mr. Meadows ever intended to go to the Willard Hotel on the night of the 5th? Mr. Meadows had a conversation with me where he wanted me to work with Secret Service on a movement from the White House to the Bullard Hotel so he could attend the meeting or meetings with Mr. Giuliani and his associates in the war room. And what was your view as to whether or not Mr. Meadows should go to the Willard that night? I had made it clear to Mr. Meadows that I didn't believe it was a smart idea for him to go to the Willard Hotel that night. I wasn't sure everything that was going on at the Willard Hotel, although I knew enough about what Mr. Giuliani and his associates were pushing during this period. I didn't think that it was something appropriate for the White House Chief of Staff to attend or to consider involvement in. I made that clear to Mr. Meadows. Throughout the afternoon, he mentioned a few more times going up to the Willard Hotel that evening and then eventually dropped the subject the night of the 5th and said that he would dial in instead. So General Flynn has uh, appeared before this committee. Uh, and when he appeared before our committee, he took the 5th. Let's briefly view a clip of General Mike Flynn taking the Fifth Amendment. Uh, General Flynn, do you believe the violence on January 6th was justified? Do we have a Yes. Fire from back. Congressman Cheney, could you repeat the question, please? Yes. General Flynn, do you believe the violence on January 6th was justified? Is that, can I get a clarification? Is that a moral question or are you asking a legal question? I'm asking both. I said I, I said the fifth. Do you believe the violence on January 6th was justified morally? Take the fifth. You believe the violence on January 6th was justified legally? Fifth. General Flynn, do you believe in the peaceful transition of power in the United States of America? The fifth. Let's move on now to January 6th and the conduct of Donald Trump and Mark Meadows during the attack on the Capitol. Ms. Hutchinson, I'd like now for us to listen to a description, your description of what transpired in the West Wing during the attack. For context, in this clip, you describe the time frame starting at about 2 p.m. So I remember Mark being alone in his office for 
a, quite some time, and you know, I, I know we've spoken about Ben Williamson going in at one point, and I, I don't personally remember Ben going in. I don't doubt that he had gone in, um, but I remember him being alone in his office for most of the afternoon, around two o'clock to two o five. Around two o'clock to two o five. You know, we were watching the TV, and I could see that the rioters were getting closer and closer to the Capitol. Mark still hadn't popped out of his office or said anything about it. So that's when I went into his office. I saw that he was sitting on his couch on his cell phone. Same as the morning where he was just kind of scrolling and typing. Um, I said, hey, are you watching the TV, Chief? Because his TV was small. and I. You can see it, but I, I didn't know if he was really paying attention. I said, you watching the TV, Chief? He was like, yeah. So the writers are getting really close. Have you talked to the president? He said, no, he wants to be alone right now, still looking at his phone. So I start to get frustrated because, you know, I sort of felt like I was watching a, this is not a great comparison, but a bad car accident that was about to happen where you can't stop it, but you want to be able to do something. And I just remember, I remember thinking in that moment, Mark needs to snap out of this, and I don't know how to snap him out of this, but he, he needs to care. And I just remember I blurted out, I said, Mark, do you know where Jim's at right now? And he looked up at me at that point and said, Jim? And I said, Mark, is, he was on the floor a little while ago giving a floor speech. Did you listen? He said, yeah, it was, it was real good. Did you like it? And I said, yeah. Do you know where he's at right now? He said, well, no, I haven't heard from him. And I said, you might want to check in with him, Mark. And I remember pointing at the TV and I said, the rioters are getting close. They might get in. And he looked at me and said something to the effect of, all right, I'll, I'll give him a call. Not long after the rioters broke into the Capitol, you described what happened with White House counsel Pat Cipollone. No more than a minute, minute and a half later, I see Pat Cipollone barreling down the hallway towards our office and rushed right in, looked at me, said, is Mark in his office? And I said, yes. He just looked at me and started shaking his head and went over, opened Mark's office door, stood there with the door propped open and said something to the, Mark still sitting on his phone. I remember like glancing and he's still sitting on his phone. And I remember Pat saying to him something to the effect of, the rioters have gotten to the Capitol, Mark. We need to go down and see the president now. And Mark looked up at him and said, he doesn't want to do anything, Pat. And Pat said something to the effect of, and very clearly <laughs> had said this to Mark, something to the effect of, Mark, something needs to be done or people are going to die and the blood's going to be on your effing hands. This is getting out of control. I'm going down there. And at that point, Mark stood up from his couch, both of his phones in his hand. He had his glasses on still. He walked out with Pat. He put both of his phones on my desk and said, let me know if Jim calls. And they walked out and went down to the dining room. A few minutes later, Representative Jordan called back. A couple minutes later, so likely around between 2.15 and 2.25. I know the tweet went out at 2.24. I don't remember if I was there when the tweet went out or if it happened right afterwards, but Jim had called. I answered the phone, said one second. He knew it was, I guess he knew it was me. I introduced myself, but I'd, I don't remember if he called my cell phone or if he had called one of Mark's. Um, but I answered the phone and said, one sec, Mark's on the hall, I'm going to go hand the phone to him. He said, okay. So I went down, I asked the valet if Mark was in the dining room. The valet said yes. I opened the door to the dining room, briefly stepped in to get Mark's attention, showed him the phone, like flipped the phone his way so he could see it said Jim Jordan. He had stepped to where I was standing there holding the door open took the phone talking to Jim with the door still propped open. So I took a few steps back. So I probably was two feet from Mark. He was standing in the doorway going to the Oval Office dining room. 
they had a brief conversation and in the crossfires, you know, I heard briefly like what they were talking about, but in the background, I had heard conversations in the Oval Dining Room at, the po at that point talking about the Hang Mike P Pence chants. That clip ended, Ms. Hutchinson, with you recalling that you heard the President, Mr. Meadows, and the White House Counsel discussing the Hang Mike Pence chants. And then you described for us what happened next. It wasn't until Mark hung up the phone, handed it back to me. I went back to my desk. A couple minutes later, him and Pat came back, possibly Eric Hirschman, too. I'm pretty sure Eric Hirschman was there. But I'm, I'm confident it was Pat that was there. Um, I remember Pat saying something to the effect of, Mark, we need to do something more. They're literally calling for the vice president to be effing hung. And Mark had responded something to the effect of, you heard him, Pat. He thinks Mike deserves it. He doesn't think they're doing anything wrong. To which Pat said something, this is effing crazy. We need to be doing something more. Briefly stepped into Mark's office, and when Mark had said something, when Mark had said something to the effect of he doesn't think they're doing anything wrong, knowing what I had heard briefly in the dining room, coupled with Pat discussing the hang Mike Pence chance in the lobby of our office, and then Mark's response, I understood there to be the rioters in the Capitol that were chanting for the vice president to be hung. Let me pause here on this point. As rioters chanted, hang Mike Pence, the president of the United States, Donald Trump, said that, quote, Mike deserves it, and that those rioters were not doing anything wrong. This is a sentiment that he has expressed at other times as well. In an interview with ABC News correspondent Jonathan Carl, President Trump was asked about the supporters chanting hang Mike Pence last year. Instead of condemning them, the former president defended them. Because it's, it's common sense, John, it's common sense that you're supposed to protect. How can you, if you know a vote is fraudulent, right? Yeah. How can you pass on a fraudulent vote to Congress? President Trump's view that the rioters were not doing anything wrong and that, quote, Mike deserved it helps us to understand why the president did not ask the rioters to leave the Capitol for multiple hours. In fact, he put this tweet out at 2.24 p.m. Ms. Hutchinson, do you recall seeing this tweet in which the president said the vice president did not have the courage to do what needed to be done? I do. And Ms. Hutchinson, what was your reaction when you saw this tweet? As a staffer that works to always represent the administration to the best of my ability and to showcase the good things that he had done for the country, I remember feeling frustrated, disappointed, and really, it, it felt personal. I, I was really sad. As an American, I was disgusted. It was unpatriotic. It was un-American. We were watching the Capitol building get defaced over a lie. And it was something that was really hard in that moment to digest, knowing what I had been hearing down the hall in the conversations that were happening, seeing that tweet come up and knowing what was happening on the Hill. And it's something that I, it's still, I still struggled to work through the emotions of that. Ms. Hedgeson, we have also spoken to multiple other White House staff about their reaction to Donald Trump's 224 tweet, condemning Mike Pence for not having the courage to refuse to count electoral votes, an act that would have been illegal. Matthew Pottinger, a former Marine intelligence officer 
who served in the White House for four years, including, including as Deputy National Security Advisor, was in the vicinity of the Oval Office at various points throughout the day. When he saw that tweet, he immediately decided to resign his position. Let's watch him describe his reaction to the President's tweet. Uh, one of my staff brought me a printout uh, of a uh, tweet uh, by the President. And the tweet uh, said something to the effect that uh, Mike Pence, the Vice President, didn't have the courage um, to, uh, to, to do what he what should have been done. Um, I uh, I read that tweet uh, and uh, made a decision at that moment to resign. Uh, that's where I knew that I was leaving that day uh, once I read that tweet. Ultimately, members of the White House staff, Sarah Matthews. Cabinet members Secretary Chow and Secretary DeVos resigned as well. Here is Secretary DeVos's resignation letter. As you can see, in resigning on January 6th, Secretary DeVos said to the President, quote, there's no mistaking the impact your rhetoric had on the situation, and it is the inflection point for me. Let's also look at Secretary Chow's resignation statement. When Secretary Chow resigned, she spoke of the January 6th attack, and she said, quote, as I am sure is the case with many of you, this has deeply troubled me in a way I simply cannot set aside. Ms. Hutchinson, in our prior interviews, we've asked you about what the President's advisors were urging him to do during the attack. You've described roughly three different camps of thought inside the White House that day. Can you tell us about those? There was a group of individuals that were strongly urging him to take immediate and swift action. I would classify the White House Counsel's Office, Mr. Hirschman, Ms. Ivanka Trump, in that category of really working to get him to take action and pleading with him to take action. There was a more neutral group where Advisors were trying to toe the line knowing that Mr. Trump didn't necessarily want to take immediate action and condemn the riots, um, but knowing something needed to be done. Um, and then there was the last group, which was deflect and blame. Let's blame Antifa. These aren't our people. It's my understanding that Mr. Meadows was in the deflect and blame category, but he did end up taking a more neutral route, knowing that there were several advisors in the president's circle urging him to take more action, um, which I think was reflected in the rhetoric released later that day in the videos. You told us that the White House Counsel's Office was in the camp encouraging the president to tell the rioters to stop the attack and to leave the Capitol. Let's listen. White House Counsel's Office wanted there to be a strong statement out to condemn the rioters. I'm confident in that. Now let's look at just one example of what some senior advisors to the president were urging. Ms. Hutchinson, could you look at the exhibit that we're showing on the screen now? Have you seen this note before? That's a note that I wrote at the direction of the Chief of Staff on January 6th, likely around 3 o'clock. And it's written on a chief of staff note card, but that's your handwriting, Ms. Hutchinson? That's my handwriting. And why did you write this note? The chief of staff was in a meeting with Eric Hirschman and potentially Mr. Philbin, and they had rushed out of the office fairly quickly. Mark had handed me the note card with one of his pens and started dictating a statement for the president to potentially put out. And... No, I'm sorry, go ahead. That's okay. Uh, there are two phrases on there, one illegal and then one without proper authority. The illegal phrase was the one that Mr. Meadows had dictated to me. Mr. Hirschman had chimed in and said, also put without legal authority. There should have been a slash between the two phrases. It was a, an or if the president had opted to put one of those statements out. Evidently, he didn't. Later that afternoon, Mark came back from the Oval Dining Room and put the palm card on my desk. 
with illegally crossed out, but said we didn't need to take further action on that statement. So um, to your knowledge, this statement was never issued? It was, to my knowledge, it was never issued. And Ms. Hutchinson, did you understand that Ivanka Trump wanted her father to send people home? That's my understanding, yes. Let's play a clip of you addressing that issue. I remember her saying at various points, you know, she wants him, she wanted her dad to send them home. She wanted her dad to tell them to go home peacefully and she wanted to include language that he necessarily wasn't on board with at the time. You will hear more about this at our later hearings, but we have evidence of many others imploring Donald Trump and Mark Meadows to take action. Here is some of that evidence, text messages sent to Mark Meadows during the attack. This is a text message at 2.32 from Laura Ingram. Hey Mark, the president needs to tell people in the Capitol to go home. In the next message, this is hurting all of us. And then he's destroying his legacy and playing into every stereotype. We lose all credibility against the BLM Antifa crowd if things go south. The president's son, Don Jr., also urgently contacted Mark Meadows. At 2.53, he wrote, he's got to condemn this shit ASAP. The Capitol Police tweet is not enough. As you will see, these are just two of the numerous examples of Trump supporters and allies urging the president to tell his supporters to leave the Capitol. It would not have been hard for the president to simply walk down to the briefing room a few feet down the hall from the Oval Office. As Nora O'Donnell noted during an interview with House Republican leader Kevin McCarthy, where Leader McCarthy said he believed the attack was un-American. I want to quickly bring in Kevin McCarthy, the House yeah. Minority Leader. Um, Leader McCarthy, do you condemn this violence? I completely condemn the violence in the Capitol. What we're currently watching unfold is un-American. I am I'm disappointed. I'm sad. This is not what our country should look like. This is not who we are. This is not the First Amendment. This has to stop, and this has to stop now. Leader McCarthy, the President of the United States has a briefing room, steps from the Oval Office. It is, the cameras are hot 24-7, as you know. Why hasn't he walked down and said that now? Uh, I've, I've, I conveyed to the president what I think is best to do, and I'm hopeful the president will do it. Republican House member Mike Gallagher also implored the president to call off the attack. Mr. President, you have got to stop this. You are the only person who can call this off. Call it off. The election is over. Call it off. This is bigger than you. It's bigger than any member of Congress. It is about the United States of America, which is more important than any politician. Call it off. It's over. Despite the fact that many people close to Donald Trump were urging him to send people home, he did not do so until later, much later. At 4.17 p.m., Donald Trump finally told the rioters to go home and that he loved them. Here's a portion of the video President Trump recorded from the White House. We have to have peace. So go home. We love you. You're very special. You've seen what happens. You see the way others are treated that are so bad and so evil. I know how you feel. But go home and go home in peace. But as we will show in even greater detail in future hearings, Donald Trump was reluctant to put this message out. And he still could not bring himself to condemn the attack. Ms. Hutchinson has told us that too. The one that he put out at 4.17. Um, I'm sure we've discussed it, and just to elaborate if I hadn't already at that point, I recall him being reluctant to film the video on the 6th. I was not involved in any of the logistics or the planning for that video. I just remember seeing the video go out 
and feeling a little shocked after it went out. On the evening of January 6th and the day after, the president's family and his senior staff and others tried to encourage the president to condemn the violence and commit to the peaceful transition of power. At 3.31 p.m. on January 6th, Sean Hannity of Fox News texted Mark Meadows. Mr. Hannity said, quote, can he make a statement? I saw the tweet. Ask people to leave the Capitol. Later that evening, Mr. Hannity sent another text message to Mark Meadows. This time, he shared a link to a tweet. That tweet reported that President Trump's cabinet secretaries were considering invoking the 25th Amendment to remove President Trump from office. As you can see on the screen, the 25th Amendment to the Constitution creates a process for the transition of power if a president is unfit or unable to serve. 25th Amendment has never been used to remove a president. But the committee has learned that after the attack on the U.S. Capitol, this was being discussed by members of President Trump's cabinet as a way of stripping the full power of the presidency from Donald Trump. President Trump's supporters were worried. In addition to the tweet that he sent Mark Meadows after the attack, Sean Hannity apparently spoke with President Trump and warned him about what could happen. We understand that this text message that Sean Hannity sent to Kayleigh McEnany on January 7th shows what Mr. Hannity said to the president. First, no more stolen election talk. Second, impeachment and 25th Amendment are real. Many people will quit. Ms. Hutchinson, you told us that you were hearing about discussions related to the 25th Amendment. Here's part of what you said. Mr. Pompeo reached out to have the conversation with Mr. Meadows in case he hadn't heard the discussions amongst the cabinet secretaries. And from what I understand, it was more of a, this is what I'm hearing. I want you to be aware of it. But I also think it's worth putting on your radar because you are the chief of staff. You're technically the boss of all the cabinet secretaries. And you know, if, if conversations progress, you should be ready to take action on this. Like, I'm concerned for you and your positioning with this. Yeah. Reach out to me if you have any questions or if, like, I would be helpful with you at all. Inside the White House, the president's advisors, including members of his family, wanted him to deliver a speech to the country. Deputy White House counsel Pat Philbin prepared the first draft of what would be the president's remarks on national healing, delivered by a pre-taped video on January 7th. When he arrived at the White House on the 7th, Mr. Philbin believed that more needed to be said. So he sat down and started writing. He shared the draft with Pat Cipollone, who also believed the president needed to say more. Mr. Cipollone agreed with the content, as did Eric Hirschman, who reviewed the draft. The committee has learned that the president did not agree with the substance as drafted and resisted giving a speech at all. Ms. Hutchinson, do you recall discussions about the president's speech on January 7th? I do. Let's listen, Ms. Hutchinson, to what you told us about that and about the process of crafting those remarks. Uh, I learned from a conversation with Mark and overhearing between him and White House counsel and um, Eric Hirschman as well that Trump didn't necessarily think he needed to do anything more on the 7th than what he had already done on the 6th when he was convinced to put out a video on the 7th he I understand that he had a lot of opinions about what the context of that announcement were to entail um, I had original drafts of the speech where you know, there were several lines that didn't make it in there about prosecuting the rioters or calling them violent. He didn't want that in there. He wanted to put in there that he wanted to potentially pardon them. Um, and this is just with the increased emphasis of his mindset at the time, which was he didn't think that they did anything wrong. He 
the people who did something wrong that day, or the person who did something wrong that day was Mike Pence by not standing with him. But the president's advisors urged him to give the speech. Who convinced him to do the video on the 7th? I'm not sure who convinced him or if it was a group of people that convinced him. Who was in the group that you're aware of? That I'm aware of. Mark, Ivanka, Jared Kushner, um, Eric Hirschman, Pat Cipollone, Pat Philbin. Those are people that I'm aware of. Do you know why that group of people thought it was necessary for him to release a statement? I believe Kelly McEnany as well. Um, from what I understood at the time, and from what the reports were coming in, there's a large concern of the 25th Amendment potentially being invoked, and there were concerns about what would happen in the Senate if it was, if the 25th was invoked. So the primary reason that I had heard, other than, you know, we did not do enough on the 6th, we need to get a stronger message out there and condemn this, this otherwise this will be your legacy. The secondary reason to that was, you know, think about what might happen in the final 15 days of your presidency if we don't do this. There's already talks about invoking the 25th Amendment. You need this as cover. The president ultimately delivered the remarks Unlike many of his other speeches, he did not ad lib much. He recited them without significant alteration, except one. Even then, on January 7th, 2021, the day after the attack on the US Capitol, the president still could not bring himself to say, quote, but this election is now over. One other point about the speech, Ms. Hutchinson. Did you hear that Mr. Trump at one point wanted to add language about pardoning those who took part in the January 6th riot? I did hear that, and I understand that Mr. Me that Mr. Meadows was encouraging that language as well. Thank you, and here's what you told us previously about that. You said he was instructed not to include it. Who was instructing him not to include language about the pardon in that January 7th? I understood from White House Counsel's office coming to our office that morning that they didn't think that it was a good idea to include that in the speech. That being Pat Cipollone? That's correct. And Eric Hirschman. Ms. Hutchinson, did Rudy Giuliani ever suggest that he was interested in receiving a presidential pardon related to January 6th? He did. And Ms. Hutchinson, did White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows ever indicate that he was interested in receiving a presidential pardon related to January 6th? Mr. Meadows did seek that pardon, yes ma'am. Thank you, Ms. Hutchinson. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I wanna thank our witness for joining us today. The members of the select committee may have additional questions for today's witness. And we ask that you respond expeditiously in writing to those questions. Without objections, members will be permitted 10 business days to submit statements for the record, including opening remarks and additional questions for the witness. Without objection, the chair recognized the vice chair for a closing statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I wanna begin by thanking Ms. Hutchinson for her testimony today. We are all in her debt. Our nation is preserved by those who abide by their oaths to our Constitution. Our nation is preserved by those who know the fundamental difference between right and wrong. And I want all Americans to know that what Ms. Hutchinson has done today is not easy. The easy course is to hide from the spotlight, to refuse to come forward, to attempt to downplay or deny what happened. That brings me to a different topic. While our committee has seen many witnesses, including many Republicans, testify fully and forthrightly, this has not been true of every witness. And we have received evidence of one particular practice that raises significant concern. Our committee commonly asks witnesses connected to Mr. Trump's administration or campaign whether they've been contacted by any of their former colleagues or anyone else who attempted to influence or impact their testimony. 
Without identifying any of the individuals involved, let me show you a couple of samples of answers we received to this question. First, here's how one witness described phone calls from people interested in that witness's testimony. Quote, what they said to me is as long as I continue to be a team player, they know I'm on the right team. I'm doing the right thing. I'm protecting who I need to protect. You know I'll continue to stay in good graces in Trump world. And they have reminded me a couple of times that Trump does read transcripts. And just keep that in mind as I proceed through my interviews with the committee. Here's another sample in a different context. This is a call received by one of our witnesses. Quote, a person let me know you have your deposition tomorrow. He wants me to let you know he's thinking about you. He knows you're loyal and you're gonna do the right thing when you go in for your deposition. I think most Americans know that attempting to influence witnesses to testify untruthfully presents very serious concerns. We will be discussing these issues as a committee, carefully considering our next steps. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I yield back. Gentlewoman yields back. Ms. Hutchinson, thank you. Thank you for doing your patriotic duty and helping the American people get a complete understanding of January 6th and its causes. Thank you for your courage in testifying here today. You have the gratitude of this committee and your country. I know it wasn't easy to sit here today and answer these questions, but after hearing your testimony in all its candor and detail, I want to speak directly to the handful of witnesses who have been outliers in our investigation, the small number who have defied us outright, those whose memories have failed them again and again on the most important details, and to those who fear Donald Trump and his enablers because of this courageous woman and others like her, your attempt to hide the truth from the American people will fail. And to that group of witnesses, if you've heard this testimony today and suddenly you remember things you couldn't previously recall, or there are some details you'd like to clarify, or you discovered some courage you had hidden away somewhere, our doors remain open. The select committee will reconvene in the weeks ahead as we continue to lay out our findings to the American people. The chair requests those in the hearing room to remain seated until the Capitol Police have escorted the witness and members from the room. Without objection, the committee stands adjourned. Well, what we have witnessed today uh, in front of the American people is something uh, we have not seen before. And we have said this a number of times after these hearings, but this is, this is quite different. You're looking at a young woman named Cassidy Hutchinson who worked directly for former Chief of Staff Mark Meadows in the Trump White House. Uh, she was a very loyal member of the Trump administration. She testified that it was her job to, to remind the American people of the policies, the victories within the Trump White House. She talked in the second part of the hearing about how hurtful it was when the former president tweeted about Mike Pence that he did not have the courage to do what needed to be done uh, in that moment. She said she took it personally, um, and we heard testimony that several other members of the Trump White House uh, felt the same way uh, in that moment. Those were the minutes, the hours, in fact, when they were urging the former president to do something about the mob over at the Capitol. She talked about walking down to the Oval Office to find her boss, uh, Mark Meadows, uh, who was in the dining room, the personal dining room right off of the Oval Office. We've talked about that room before where the former president would often watch television. Uh, and Mark Meadows had gone to, to talk with the former president. She came to the doorway because I believe she said at the time Jim Jordan, member of Congress, was on the phone, uh, wanted to talk to Mark Meadows. And she said when she passed the phone to her boss, Mark Meadows, 
she could then hear the other part of the conversation playing out uh, in that personal dining room. Uh, the news of, of the chants that were taking place over at the Capitol, uh, the hang Mike Pence chants. Uh, she then testified before the American people about um, her disbelief uh, and her sadness uh, that the president did not defend his former vice president in that moment, did not act immediately uh, to protect uh, the vice president uh, when it was clear the former president knew and was fully aware uh, of the chance to hang Mike Pence. We'll get into what she said in the second half here in just a moment, but just the broader picture, the reaction coming in uh, from members of the Republican Party and from members of Trump's uh, inner circle. Uh, we got reaction from Mark Meadows' predecessor. Now, her boss was Mark Meadows, the former chief of staff, and the chief of staff before Meadows was Mick Mulvaney. And he tweeted out uh, during testimony this afternoon, my guess is that before this is over, we will be hearing testimony from Ornato, Engel, Meadows. Of course, Ornato, the deputy chief of staff, Meadows, Mark Meadows, Engel, the Secret Service agent tasked with protecting the president. He was the one she testified that the president um, you know, essentially uh, reached for in the beast, which is that the, the, the main car for the president, obviously, in the motorcade. Mulvaney goes on to say in that tweet you see there, he, he tweets, this is explosive stuff. If Cassidy is making this up, they will need to say that. If she isn't, they will have to corroborate. And he goes on to write, and this is the key line of the tweet that will make uh, news beyond, beyond us right here. He wrote, I know her. I don't think she's lying. I want to bring in our chief Washington correspondent, Jonathan Carl. Uh, John, the weight of this testimony today. Just absolutely incredible, David. 25 years old again, Cassidy Hutchinson having the courage to come forward and do uh, what so few inside the Trump White House have been willing to do, come out publicly, freely, and to tell the truth uh, about what they witnessed. And the Mick Mulvaney there raises a very good question. Uh, Pat Cipollone is another name uh, I would mention. We heard uh, his name invoked uh, quite a few times. He's the White House counsel. As White House counsel, you have a very good uh, claim on executive privilege. But these are extraordinary circumstances. Isn't it time uh, for Pat Cipollone to come forward and tell in his words what he witnessed on that day, the way John Dean, who was also the White House counsel, uh, did uh, during the Watergate hearings when he told the truth about his interactions uh, with Richard Nixon. Uh, the two Secret Service agents, uh, 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 Robert Engel, the lead agent on uh, President Trump, um, Tony Ornato, who was a, again, he was, he was a Secret Service agent. He took leave uh, to be the Deputy Chief of Staff. Now he is again a Secret Service agent. Now there is a great tradition of Secret Service agents, uh, you know, keeping to themselves about this for obvious reasons. But again, these are extraordinary times. They were witness to extraordinary events. Will they come forward and will they tell their story about what they saw? Uh, th th this, was, this was by far David, uh, the biggest and most consequential of these uh, January 6th hearings. And as you know, we've witnessed before this five very big and consequential hearings. Uh, uh, this was at another level. That's the big picture view. And John, I want to ask you about one key piece of testimony in this second half, and we'll dissect it all a little later on World News Tonight. But in the meantime, John, you heard this. Uh, Cassidy Hutchinson describing after she had gone to the personal dining room off of the Oval, uh, heard that the former president was aware of these chants to hang Mike Pence. Uh, this was uh, not long after that. She was back uh, near her office, her, her post, uh, just outside Mark Meadows' office. White House counsel comes down the hallway, uh, says to Mark Meadows, uh, Mark, we need to do something here. They're literally calling for the vice president to be blank hung. Uh, Mark had responded something to the effect of, well, you heard him, Pat, referring to the former president, President Trump. He thinks Mike deserves it. He doesn't think they're doing anything wrong. And, and David, there was more even beyond that when they, uh, you know, the people around, Pat Cipollone and others around the president said he had to come out and do another statement on January 7th, the day after the attack, uh, to finally do what he had failed to do on January 6th, which is to condemn the attack. Uh, she characterized the, uh, Donald Trump's view at, at this point was that the rioters themselves, those that attacked the building, didn't do anything wrong. The only person that did something wrong on that day was Mike Pence. Um, and then uh, the, the, the committee uh, mentioned uh, something that still 
to this day blows me away. An interview that I had with Donald Trump um, about six weeks after he left the White House, where I asked him about those hang Mike Pence chants, and, and even then, uh, he refused to condemn the people calling for his vice president's execution, saying it's common sense. How can you pass on a fraudulent vote? In other words, he was defending, explaining, rationalizing uh, the, the chance of the people uh, that were saying, hang Mike Pence. We remember that conversation well, John, the audio from that conversation. Uh, the interview you had with the former president after he left office. Our John Carl, our thanks to you. I want to bring in Mary Bruce over at the White House, covered Congress extensively during the Trump administration. Mary, how much pressure now on these former members of Trump's inner circle to testify, to give uh, their version of this, to somehow either say what Cassidy Hutchinson said today was not the truth, or to acknowledge that she has described accurately what played out in those final hours? Yeah, the big question, David, is whether this is going to be a turning point. And you heard uh, the chairman there raising this question, whether her testimony will encourage others, uh, whether, whether it will jog their memory or encourage them to come forth now and be willing to speak more publicly. That's the big question. But the pressure still remains that these uh, members of Congress, especially who have been very close with the Trump camp, with the former president, there is still a lot of pressure on them not to break with Donald Trump. Donald Trump is still, for all intents and purposes, the leader of the Republican Party, and he has a huge sway and power over the Republican Party. And whether or not this testimony will impact that remains to be seen. And David, we should say we are also hearing from Donald Trump. It seems he has been paying uh, rather close attention today. Yes, he said he did not know Cassidy Hutchinson, but uh, Mary, you know the inner workings of the White House very well. Uh, they were effective, the committee, in putting up that map of the West Wing, showing it's just a few steps uh, from literally where Cassidy Hutchinson sat outside Mark Meadows' office to get to the Oval. There you see what they had prepped for the American people today. Uh, difficult to believe that the former president had, had knew little about her or little, knew little of her. That would be almost impossible. I mean, given I can tell you I'm right outside the West Wing right now, it is a very tight space given how closely she worked with Mark Meadows for many years and in the West Wing. Uh, the fact that Donald Trump didn't know her is very hard to believe. And he is uh, putting out some messages responding to some of her testimony. He's saying he never complained about the crowd size that day at his rally, uh, which she noted as part of her explanation for why he wanted uh, them to not be, to, to be able to, to wave going through the mags, uh, despite the fact that they had uh, some of them were found with weapons on them. Uh, he also says it's false to say that he tried to grab the steering wheel, uh, as she recounted um, her understanding that he tried to grab the steering wheel as they were heading uh, towards the Capitol because Donald Trump was so intent on getting up there that day. He said that's sick and fraudulent. The former president also saying it was ridiculous that he threw food. Uh, he was so frustrated with the attorney general's uh, response about uh, the election results. But David, what he is not taking issue with are the claims that he knew that the crowd was going to be violent and that he did nothing to stop them. Very interesting to point that out, Mary Bruce. Our thanks to you. And again, part of that message from the former president, I hardly know who this person, Cassidy Hutchinson, is. And again, Mary pointing out that she was just a couple of steps from the Oval. And not only that, she testified today that um, she was, in so many words, proud of her role uh, celebrating the victories, the policy achievements of the Trump administration, was a very, very loyal member of that team, loyal to Mark Meadows, to the former president, to Mike Pence. And she talked about, uh, in particular, what it meant as the, the, the chance grew louder to hang Mike Pence, uh, how she felt when the former president tweeted out that uh, Mike Pence did not have the courage to do what was needed to be done, as uh, so many around the former president were urging him to do something to stop what was playing out. I want to bring in Pierre Thomas because the other piece of testimony today that that stands out uh, among so many key points that Cassidy Hutchinson shared with the American people that we had not heard before, but that one um, storyline, the narrative of the motorcade leaving that rally in the morning, uh, that multiple law enforcement agencies had already told the former president's uh, inner circle that uh, that this had begun to unfold, the chaos. It was uh, unstable at the Capitol. They, they told the president, the Secret Service charged with protecting the president, the particular agent in the beast with him, that's what they call obviously the, the vehicle that the president travels in, told him it is simply not safe uh, to bring you up to the Capitol, Mr. President, in so many words. Uh, the president uh, then, as described by Cassidy Hutchinson, 
uh, lunging, uh, in so many words, uh, for that agent in a moment uh, of rage, as she described it, uh, inside the beast. You know the Secret Service. Um, you know, they've taken their hits through the years and their critiques. Uh, but one thing you cannot say is that they're not loyal uh, to the presidents and first families that they serve. Indeed, David, and I uh, have reached out to a senior official who uh, will not comment specifically on the altercation, but did say flatly that uh, the president had wanted to go to Capitol Hill and that the Secret Service rejected that request by the President of the United States. Now, David, as you point out, the Secret Service is loath to talk about the interpersonal and direct relationships uh, with the White House and the President in particular. But in this case, I think Mr. Inger is going to be under incredible pressure to say whether this, in fact, did happen. And the other thing, David, uh, to note is, as you pointed out, this notion that the security situation was getting worse and worse as time went on during the course of that morning and that day. Uh, you have law enforcement officials the day before uh, the uh, insurrection, January 6th, warning about the potential that the Capitol itself might be a target. Uh, David, the fact that so little was done to prepare for it, and David, we learned today that they had evidence of a man in a tree with an AR-15 assault-style rifle. Now, whether they found that person or not, that should have set off a series of very robust efforts to uh, calm the crowd and get the president out of there. Yeah, that was extraordinary. Uh, Congresswoman Cheney playing some of the messages that were coming into dispatch from members of law enforcement witnessing uh, what they said were uh, at least a couple of instances involving AR-15 style assault rifles there at the Capitol as this was all beginning to unfold. And Pierre, one quick question to you before we move on, and we're, we're about to wrap up our coverage here, but Pierre, I did want to ask you, because Congresswoman Liz Cheney at the very beginning uh, of this hearing today methodically went over uh, the, a number of agencies. Now, they, they face a real critique for not having been prepared or getting the information out to the American people well in advance, uh, given the intelligence that something uh, dangerous could happen on January 6th. But she did make the point today, pointing to evidence that they have obtained, uh, as, the, uh, as the committee has been doing their work for nearly a year now, that multiple agencies warned this White House, from the Capitol Police to the Secret Service, uh, in the days leading up to January 6th, that this could turn uh, very dangerous. David, one of the, the great mysteries about all of this is given this intelligence that the Capitol Police had, the Secret Service had concern, uh, other agencies were getting bits of information that the crowd that was going to be there to support Trump wasn't necessarily simply going to fight the counter-protesters, Antifa, if you will, but that they were there to perhaps target the Capitol itself. And the fact that so little was done, David, is one of the big mysteries that we still fully don't have all the answers to. Yeah, questions about why nothing was done and questions now for Trump's inner circle now that there's been testimony before the American people that they at least had been told. If the American people didn't know about it, uh, certainly the former White House uh, did know of the intelligence from multiple agencies. Our thanks to you, Pierre. Uh, two more questions before we go. Sarah Isger, who we talked to uh, during the break, the recess before, I want to come back to her, a former spokesperson with the Trump Department of Justice and obviously an ABC News contributor now. Sarah, I'm curious, when, when you read that Mick Mulvaney tweet as well, we reported it on the air that he said, my guess is that before this is over, we will be hearing testimony from Renato Engel, Meadows, uh, members of Trump's inner circle in these final hours, because he says this is explosive stuff. I know her. I don't think she's lying. What do you make of what he tweeted? Do you agree with him that we should see others come forward now? I absolutely think we'll see a lot of pressure for those folks to testify and either rebut what she said or corroborate it. Right now, everything is relying on Cassidy Hutchison's credibility. We have no reason to question her at this point. And in fact, we're not seeing other Republicans or other members of Trump's inner circle uh, rebut these claims. Uh, and so, yes, uh, she uh, carried herself off as a patriot with a lot of credibility. I think we will see more people come forward and corroborate what she said. Our thanks to Sarah Isger here with us this afternoon. Terry Moran, I want to come to you, senior national correspondent. Of course, Terry's covered multiple administrations uh, in Washington. Uh, big picture here, a couple of key things that we learned today, this moment in the beast, which we don't have to go back over, this, this tension with the Secret Service agent. But this, this notion that the president was aware of, of the violence, of the chaos beginning to unfold at the Capitol uh, and still very much wanted to go to the Capitol. We, we, Mark Meadows had written that this was, metaphorically speaking, the president said, 
said, I'll be there with you uh, in a sense, uh, you know, I support what, what you're headed there to do, the message you want to send. Uh, today we learned before the American people um, from multiple pieces of evidence that were displayed that the president did want to go. And not only that, he was in the motorcade and became uh, enraged when the Secret Service told him uh, that he simply couldn't because of security reasons. That is also a profound development here today from the committee. It is, David. It's astonishing. It's shocking. It's one of the most shocking scenes in the history of the American presidency, and it's checkable. It's a checkable fact. There were other people in that car. Uh, the testimony of Cassidy Hutchison is, is a moment in American history. She takes the American people into the inner circle directly, an eyewitness, a participant in discussions on the day the Capitol was attacked uh, and in the days leading up to it. And one of the details that you just mentioned, uh, Donald Trump was planning that day to go to Capitol Hill against what his own White House counsel was advising because for a president who had lost the election as certified by the 50 sovereign states of this country to basically go to the Capitol to rally or demand the presidency be awarded to him, to say nothing of inciting what he knew was an armed crowd, they won't hurt me, he said, uh, is just almost, almost incredible. I think one of the things that today did was for a lot of Americans who thought about January 6th, they were sad, they were disgusted by it. They thought, well, that's chaos. That's Trump's chaos. Yeah, people got out of hand. He's, he was uh, incompetent if he was trying to stage a coup. What we heard today from Cassidy Hutchison from inside that inner circle is that this was a direction that he was determined to go. Not, not just physically, but arranging and organizing and orchestrating a mob to attack the Capitol so he could seize the power that the 50 sovereign states had given to Joe Biden, the American people had given to Joe Biden. It is a shocking day in American history. Yeah, we're all students of history here. And Terry, when you hear the description of a former president reaching for the steering wheel in the motorcade, have you ever heard of anything like that before? Uh, you know, I'm old enough to remember Watergate. I actually remember the testimony of, of John Dean uh, and, and the way the country reacted to that being taken into the Nixon inner circle. Really, they, and Nixon was you know, coming apart at the seams at the end of his presidency. He was drinking a lot, uh, you know, praying with uh, Henry Kissinger in ways that Kissinger thought were, was unhinged. But nothing like this can I remember. We have had presidents who've had tempers. We've had all kinds of men of different characters in the presidency. Good characters, lousy characters. There's something mad in, in what we heard in the description of Donald Trump today, something deeply dangerous morally and psychologically. Terry Moran watching the hearings with us here today. Terry, thank you. Uh, and one last question before we uh, send this back to regular programming. John Carl, uh, Chief Washington Correspondent, of course, watching this every step of the way with us, John. You heard uh, Congresswoman Liz Cheney, Vice Chair of the committee there at the end, uh, talk about the intimidation, the pressure put on these witnesses. There have been so few willing to come forward today. And we've talked about this at length here this afternoon, that Cassidy Hutchinson is young. She had uh, and likely still has a very bright future ahead of her, but she, uh, a lot is at stake in coming forward today. She testified how loyal she was to the Trump administration, how proud she was of the policies, of the, uh, the victories, the achievements they had, and, and, uh, and how personally um, it hurt she was, particularly in those moments of hang Mike Pence, that the former president wasn't doing more to stop what was playing out in, in Washington, and that she became scared was the word I believe she used after that conversation with Rudy Giuliani on an evening a couple of days prior to January 6th. But when you see what Liz Cheney put up there before the American people, and these were different examples from um, a, a wide array of witnesses, phone calls, uh, communications with them um, from uh, other members uh, close to the former president, essentially telling them, uh, putting pressure on them, um, be careful, if you will. There was a clear effort, according to Liz Cheney, uh, to intimidate previous witnesses before this committee in those depositions. Uh, the language, frankly, sounding like it's straight out of uh, a mafia intimidation campaign, uh, warning those who are testifying that the president, the former president, reads transcripts. Uh, you don't want to be off Team Trump. Uh, Liz Cheney did not mention which witnesses received uh, these threats. Uh, she said there were several of them, and she said the committee would be investigating them. Clearly an effort to try to tamper with these witnesses. That in and of itself a crime. Thank you.
uh, David. So this is something they're looking into, and it's a reason why this hearing happened on such short notice and with such secrecy. Uh, they were really worried that, that there would be an effort to get to Cassidy Hutchinson to try to uh, intimidate her uh, and convince her not to testify. Fortunately uh, for all of us who got to see what she saw on January 6th, uh, that did not happen. Jonathan Carl. Uh, live at the Capitol there for us again today. John, thank you. Our coverage uh, will continue on ABC News Live, of course, abcnews.com as well. I'll be back with the entire team for World News tonight, and I, I thank John, Terry, Pierre, Mary, uh, Sarah Isger as well for our coverage here this afternoon. I'm David Muir in New York. We'll see you for World News tonight. Good day. This has been a special report from ABC News. And David, thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. Stunning testimony from today's only witness, Cassidy Hutchinson, as we have all been watching quite a damning and riveting January 6th committee hearing. Cassidy, only 25 years old, the former top advisor to President Trump's chief of staff, Mark Meadows, gave a jaw-dropping behind-the-scenes account of what happened on Insurrection Day, even describing the former president, Donald Trump, attacking his own Secret Service agent because that agent would not drive him closer to the Capitol to join that violent mob. When the president got in the beast, he was under the impression from Mr. Meadows that the off-the-record movement to the Capitol was still possible and likely to happen, but that Bobby had more information. So once the president had gotten into the vehicle with Bobby, he thought that they were going up to the Capitol, and when Bobby had relayed to him, we're not, we don't have the assets to do it, it's not secure, we're going back to the West Wing. The president had very strong, a very angry response to that. Um, Tony described him as being irate. The president said something to the effect of, I'm the effing president, take me up to the Capitol now. To which Bobby responded, sir, we have to go back to the West Wing. The president reached up towards the front of the vehicle to grab at the steering wheel. Mr. Engel grabbed his arm, said, sir, you need to take your hand off the steering wheel. We're going back to the West Wing. We're not going to the Capitol. Mr. Trump then used his free hand to lunge towards Bobby Angle. And Mr. when Mr. Renato had recounted this story to me, he had motioned towards his clavicles. Incredible details. We begin with ABC News Chief Washington Correspondent John Carl. I'll tell you what, John, riveting revelations. We have never, ever witnessed a hearing like this, nor this type of behavior of a U.S. president. I mean, lunging at your own Secret Service agent. I mean, frankly, she's describing the actions of a madman. Uh, really jaw-dropping testimony from, as you mentioned, a, a, an aide in the White House who was just 25 years old, but who was right there in the middle of it all. Uh, the principal aide to the chief of staff, one of the few officials that was in the West Wing, uh, throughout all of January 6th, except for the time when she was in the motorcade going to the president's speech on January 6th. She witnessed all of this. So many of those around the president at that time have uh, either refused to come forward and talk to the committee or have been very circumspect in how they have answered the questions or, or who have uh, taken the fifth. But in this case, you had uh, this very brave woman come forward and describe in vivid chilling detail everything that she saw and really what she is describing is a president who wants to personally lead an effort to stop the transition of power really personally lead the effort to engage in a coup by stopping the formal certification of the end of his presidency which is what was happening on on january 6th uh absolutely stunning and i, I gotta tell you kira i uh, I mean, I've, I've reported and, 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 and done a lot of, I mean, I've, I've spent a lot of time researching in uh, January 6th and everything around it. It's hard to get surprised by anything anymore. With this testimony, I learned a lot that was new. Uh, and, and it was a window into, into Donald Trump's actions on January 6th that I had never seen before. Absolutely astounding. 
So then let me ask you, let me ask you, with that said, the fact that you mm -hmm. have learned so many new details here, and really, now we're hearing about the President of the United States uh, allegedly assaulting his own Secret Service agent, uh, Pat Cipollone, White House counsel, you know, begging uh, Cassidy Hutchinson, according to her, to tell Mark Meadows, tell the president he cannot go to the Capitol. There's legal ramifications. This could get violent. There's security uh, ramifications. He, he listed all the reasons why he, he shouldn't go. You know, what, what more does this tell us about Trump does it push the needle any further with regard to possible criminal charges or any action taken towards him or even impacting uh, a, another presidential run? I mean, today was definitely different from other things we have heard in previous hearings, for sure. Uh, it, definitely different on the criminal side. Uh, I, I just don't know. Although uh, one of the interesting things that we heard was the words of Pat Cipollone, who has refused uh, to come forward to testify in person. Uh, but we heard Pat Cipollone's words through Cassidy Hutchinson, and we heard what he said when Trump first, uh, when it was when he first found that Trump wanted to go up to the Capitol. This is uh, this is before the speech. This is before January sixth. And he said, "Look, we, we, we've got to we've got to get this out. Uh, we've got to we've got to take this idea off the table because if he goes up, you know, we're, we're all going to be prosecuted for any number of crimes, uh, and the, the crimes ultimately would be stopping a, a proceeding of the Congress, uh, uh, the ultimate uh, the ultimate high crime and misdemeanor. Um, so, the legal question where that goes, I, I just don't know. But politically, um, how?" Republicans who have continued to support Donald Trump respond to this, I think, will be will, will be important to hear in the coming days. I mean, not just the description of how he wanted to go to the Capitol and how he was trying to overrule his Secret Service and how he wanted to let the, you know, take down the mags, you know, the, the uh, you know, let, let the people in with the body armor and the weapons. Um, not just that, but also the, the, the testimony of, of, of what he said about Mike Pence um, and how he had believed that Mike Pence deserved what those chanting hang Mike Pence were saying. Um, you know, how will Republicans answer to that? Are, are they just going to say, ah, this is a, a witch hunt, this was a one-sided hearing? I mean, that's hard. That's getting hard to say. This is somebody who was not just a, uh, you know, a loyal staffer in the Trump White House, but somebody who had worked for Steve Scalise, the number two Republican uh, on the Hill, um, somebody uh, who was known uh, by, by Republicans and, and is a Republican and has never been, you know, somebody to, to, to cross uh, Trump or the Republicans before. She was shaken by what she saw, and that's why she came out and spoke. There wasn't a political agenda here. She's one of them, or was. And 25 years old, she has yeah. her whole career, her whole future in front of her, um, and you know she could so so much to lose by going out on a limb like this. If indeed um, she does not get the support she so well deserves, John, and you bring up a really great point. Let me take this over to our senior national correspondent Terry Moran. And Terry, you have talked about this quite a bit. We both have talked quite about this, and that is this spell Trump has over the GOP, over uh, over fellow Republicans, that no matter what he does, he still gets the support, he still gets the backing. How can you, after hearing what we heard today, how, how could a member of the Republican Party really say that this is an individual that they want would want to see uh, become president once again, um, I mean, this is this has got to somehow, in some way, shape, or form, shake up the GOP in ways that we haven't seen thus far. 
Thus far, is right, Kira, the, not since he came down that escalator. He said he could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody, and his people would follow. And they, and they have. He has a vice-like grip on, on much of the Republican Party, in part because he is literally shameless. He is implacable. He doesn't give a good whatever about the opinion of the elites or anyone else, and they love him for it. Uh, th these are millions of Americans who felt left out, looked down upon, uh, not respected, uh, and, and wanting change that no one would deliver. Trump came promising it with the skills of an instinctive demagogue. Uh, and, and they latched onto him because they knew he was the hammer that would break the system that they believe was failing them and restore it in their judgment, make America great again, to a time when they felt they and their families and communities and their traditions were respected more in America. And that generated a loyalty that to this day hasn't been broken. Now, that said, the portrait that uh, Cassidy Hutchinson painted of Donald Trump from the inside, and as Jonathan said, she's, she's a Republican. She wants, she's got, you know, no ax to grind here except that she feels on January 6th and in the days leading up to it, the country she loves was being betrayed. And so that is why she's there. And she describes a, a Donald Trump who is just unhinged. Madman is, is the word Jonathan just used. And it's, and it's true that he, he seemed dangerous, morally capable of doing anything, psychologically capable of doing anything, if her testimony is accurate, lunging at the driver to drive him to the Capitol where a mob was attacking to block the election that he had legitimately lost, that the people of the United States, as certified by the 50 states of this country, had, had awarded to Joe Biden. And he just, he couldn't tolerate it. And so he incited, planned, directed a mob to try to stop it. And, and I think that w when enough of that sinks in, because this is from the inner circle, there may be just enough, just enough Republicans, which would make it not impossible for him to get the nomination. He could. But perhaps difficult for him to get over the hump in a general election where he needs more than that desperately loyal base of his. Let's take it now to our White House uh, correspondent, uh, Mary Bruce. You know, Mary Bruce, I would love to be in your position right now, moving over into the West Wing, maybe even the briefing room, maybe even back there where all the comms folks are, and be a fly on the wall or just a part of the conversation to hear how the heck the Biden White House is reacting to everything we all just heard and witnessed. Yeah, you know, Kira, they have been very tight-lipped, obviously not offering much response to these, these hearings publicly. The president, of course, is actually overseas right now at the G7. He's in Madrid, Spain. So they, they, they have a good excuse for why they aren't responding to this one. But I think they certainly will probably uh, be a, as astounded as the rest of us are by this uh, really shocking testimony today um, and laying out so really meticulously what exactly, uh, you know, she says happened on that day and just how intent the president was no matter what with you know as she showed uh, what appears to be a complete disregard for for anyone's safety that, that he you know as she described was well aware of the potential for violence uh, and that he said you know it doesn't matter because because they won't the crowd won't hurt me that he was willing to basically do whatever it took and that those in his inner circle his chief of staff was basically unwilling to stand up to him uh, probably because he knew that, that, that Trump didn't want to hear it and it would maybe it wouldn't matter anyways but the fact that you have so many in Trump's circle in the White House you know it was a small a core group here then uh, that weren't willing to tell the president and could not sway him to stop any of this. Mary, thanks. And ABC News senior justice correspondent Pierre Thomas has also been watching all this testimony. And Pierre, you know, it did reveal that Trump had even asked that metal detectors be removed from the Capitol. He, he said that these, these, well, the testimony she gave was that he said they weren't going to hurt him. Let them in. It's okay. What do you make of that part of the testimony? Uh, where does the DOJ go from here with regard to that? Well, Kira, that's a complete and utter disregard for the security of not only the president, but everyone else who was there. And when the president said that um, they weren't there to harm him, with thousands of people in the crowd, one of the first things law enforcement will tell you, you don't know who's there. 
There are people who support the president. There are people who are against the president. And one of the reasons why you want magnetometers and other security measures is to make sure that no one pro-Trump, against Trump, you know, could do anything to anyone with a weapon. And what they found is that they were confiscating brass knuckles, uh, knives, all kinds of body armor. So there was every indication that there were people in that crowd who were prepared for violence. Now, many in law enforcement thought that it would be skirmishes between, you know, pro-Trump supporters and anti-Trump supporters. But they, we also learned today that there was concrete, specific evidence, or intelligence, if you will, that the t capital itself would become the target, not the groups fighting once an, uh, one another, but that the capital itself would become a target. And again, it's just another layer of evidence that the security for the U.S. Capitol on January 6th was beyond woeful. It's pretty incredible to hear. Sarah Isker, you know, we've talked a lot about this and how important it was to hear all of this testimony and in particular, pretty damning testimony from Republicans and not just Republicans, but solid Trump supporters, even Fox News journalists who have personal relationships with the president reaching out to stop this. And now we're seeing these tweets, Donald Trump putting out his own comments, talking specifically about Cassidy Hutchinson. I hardly know this person, Cassidy Hutchinson, other than I heard very negative things about her, total phony, a leaker. And when she requested to go with certain others of the team to Florida after my having served a full term in office, I personally turned her request down. So now he's saying personally turned her request down, but he's never heard of her, so he's contradicting himself. I understand that she was very upset and angry. I didn't want her to go or be a member of this team. She is bad news. I mean, here we go again. It's typical Trump tweets. <laughs> We've seen this before. It's his M.O. But what's interesting to me is how he's also very publicly said that Kevin McCarthy, the Republican minority leader in the House, made a big mistake not putting, you know, Trump loyal House members on this committee because there's been no one to push back, no one to cross examine some of these witnesses. The problem with that theory is that those people have every opportunity to go on cable news, to go on Twitter, to defend the president. And we haven't seen that. It'll be interesting after this testimony, which is by far the most damning we've heard so far, whether there's more of that. But frankly, Donald Trump, uh, you know, rebutting only the most superficial parts of her testimony, whether there was ketchup on the walls, that kind of misses the point. Yeah, and just to give that perspective, if, if for folks that are just tuning in, Cassidy Hutchinson explaining that uh, Trump, uh, she would witness him throwing these tantrums, uh, pulling uh, the, the linens off the table where the plates go flying, and then that particular day he wasn't happy about not being able to go to the Capitol, so apparently he threw his plate of food, the ketchup going on the floor, broken plates everywhere. It, it really, it's like a petulant child that can't handle uh, being told what's the right thing to do. So here Here's my question. Could we see other people that were named today, Sarah, testify? I mean, boy, we'd sure love to hear from, from Bobby Engel, um, the Secret Service agent that apparently Trump, you know, assaulted in, in the beast. Um, even the head of his Secret Service, uh, Tony Ornato, or others. Is it, is it possible that more people will now come forward wanting to say something because Cassidy broke the ice here? Well, it's clear that there are plenty of people who are available to corroborate her testimony. Mick Mulvaney, her former boss, the former chief of staff before Mark Meadows, coming out very publicly and saying that he knows her and he does not believe that she is lying and that those people can and will corroborate her testimony. I think part of the issue for Mark Meadows is whether, in fact, he will need to plead the Fifth Amendment, meaning protect himself against incrimination on possible criminal charges, obstruction of official proceedings, destruction of documents, he may not be able to testify. The Secret Service members you mentioned uh, are still active Secret Service. They will have a real problem testifying against a former protectee that would go against Secret Service protocol. But clearly there are other people involved who are able to talk about what happened that day, and I think we will hear from them. Well, it's definitely, uh, you can't stop watching and listening, that is for sure, Sarah. Thank you. Thanks to all of you. And if you did miss today's explosive hearing, we are going to rerun it in full today, 4 p.m. Eastern, right here on ABC News Live, also again at 11 p.m. Eastern.
Coming up, dozens of migrants are found dead in the back of an 18-wheeler in Texas. The president calling it horrifying and heartbreaking. Where the investigation stands next. This is GMA3, what you need to know. GMA3. A third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon. It's all about you. Lunchtime on ABC. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions. Straightforward reporting. No spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. This season, we're taking it up a level. I'm teaching my celebrity guests survival skills. Your life will depend on it. Then they need to face the wild alone. Bear! And failure is not an option. I'm sure if he's asking me to do it, I can do it, right? All of a sudden, he's gone. He doesn't even cook your breakfast or anything. Everything's lethal out here. There's no turning back. Oh, God! Oh! Who talked me into this? Running Wild with Bear Grylls. New season, Monday, July 25th at 9 on National Geographic. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Steve. Martin, Selena. This week, they're taking a break from solving murders in the building to be on GMA. Fantastic. <laughs> Plus, country music star Jimmy Allen performing for you. This week on Good Morning America. More performances by Dr. Bull? That rocks. He's got the moves that make your animals groove. Let's go. It's a show you won't want to miss. I'm not going to be here forever. Maybe. <laughs> the Incredible Dr. Bull, Saturday, July 16th at 9 on Net Geo Wild. So glad you're streaming with us. Some of the day's top headlines. The grandmother of the Uvalde school shooter is released from the hospital more than one month after being shot by her grandson, Salvador Ramos. 66-year-old Celia Sally Gonzalez was shot in the face in her home before her grandson opened fire at Robb Elementary, killing 19 students and two teachers. It's being called one of the worst suspected human cases of human smuggling, rather, at least 50 people found dead, including children inside a tractor trailer near San San Antonio. Rescuers pulled several people from the truck still alive but suffering from heat exhaustion as temps topped 100 degrees. Federal investigators now questioning three suspects who may be involved. President Biden releasing a statement earlier today calling the incident a horrifying and heartbreaking tragic loss of life. A New York judge sentencing Ghislaine Maxwell to 20 years in prison today for helping convicted sex offender Jeffrey Epstein sexually abuse underage girls. The British socialite is also ordered to pay a $750,000 fine. Maxwell was convicted in December of sex trafficking and other crimes. New details in that Missouri Amtrak train derailment. At least four people are dead, dozens more injured after a train collided with a dump truck. The train was carrying more than 240 people from Los Angeles to Chicago when eight passenger cars derailed, turning most of that train entirely on its side. The NTSB is now investigating. Straight ahead, Russia targets a shopping mall in Ukraine. Our James Longman was on the scene moments after the strike. More details when we return. Tonight, the unplanned January 6th public hearing, what new evidence has revealed. Plus, as the Supreme Court rules on war cases, the fallout over Roe v. Wade continues. More Americans turn to World News Tonight with David Muir, the most watched program on all of television. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCNews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCNews.com. And here's to everything ahead. The Boy Scouts knew they had a problem. Parents gave the Boy Scouts the most valuable thing they had, their children. And they told parents, you can trust us. They're unbelievably heartbreaking stories. So many of them are haunted by who they would have become if this never happened to them. 
This is about how to move from victim to survivor. When the detective says he confessed to abuse him, I no longer had to prove to people that I was abused. I was free. We know who we are, where we come from, and where we belong. This is the story of how we live, how we survive for thousands of years. We're still maintaining our culture, and we're fighting for it, generation after generation. It's important to pass these skills on. We make it work out here. Something very beautiful about it. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Russia launches a new attack on Ukraine, this time targeting a shopping mall packed with people. Ukraine's President Zelensky saying that the death toll could be unimaginable. Foreign correspondent James Longman has more from the scene. In the wake of the horrific Russian attack on a shopping mall in Kremenchuk, at least 18 people are dead, many others still missing, and over 59 injured, with officials calling this attack a mass casualty event. President Zelensky says that over a thousand civilians were inside the mall just before the missiles struck. This video circulating online shows moments after the strike, people desperately trying to escape. And for those unable to get out on their own, emergency workers rushing into the scene hoping to rescue any survivors. You can see this is a recovery operation underway. They're trying to get as much of this rubble out to see if there are any survivors. But look, this is just hell. The mall was miles away from the front line with no military significance. Russia has repeatedly, indiscriminately hit civilian targets since this war began. This is not only war against Ukraine, uh, Russia against Ukraine. This is war of evil against good people. And at the hospital, an agonizing wait for news. Just been shown this photo of Tanya, this is Igor's girlfriend. He's too devastated to speak. They think she was at the mall, they can't reach her. President Zelensky labeled Russia the world's largest terror organization. <laughs> saying this attack is one of the most daring terrorist acts in European history. This as Western leaders meet at the G7 conference in Germany, meeting virtually with the Ukrainian president, the group calling Monday's attack a war crime. And Kira, you can see that the recovery effort has been going on all night. Firefighters, first responders, maybe the faint hope that they could find some survivors. I think more likely a recovery effort now. We've had the G7 meeting this week. NATO uh, leaders are meeting. There's more advanced U.S. weaponry arriving in the country. All of these could be reasons why Vladimir Putin is stepping up his air attacks into Ukraine this week. Kira. James Longman, thanks so much. And the trial for WNBA star Brittany Griner is now set to begin Friday. The 31-year-old Phoenix Mercury Center has been held in Russia since February on drug smuggling charges and has now been ordered to remain in custody for another six months. Our TJ Holmes has the latest. Another setback for WNBA star Brittany Griner, now held in Russia for more than four months. A Russian court has extended her detention another six months, pending the outcome of her trial, which is set to begin Friday. Brittany, how do you feel? Appearing for the first time in court Monday, the six foot nine Griner, seen here unmasked and handcuffed to a prison guard, surrounded by security as she's escorted into the pretrial hearing in Moscow. Her lawyers gave a brief update about how she's doing. It was the prolongation of the arrest, not, not more than that. How does she feel? She's fine. She's fine. Does she feel? As she could be. In a statement, Griner's reps tell ABC News, the fact remains that the U.S. government has determined that Brittany Griner is wrongfully detained and being used as a political pawn. On February 17th, Griner was detained on suspicion of drug smuggling at a Russian airport when officials say they confiscated vape cartridges containing hashish oil, which is illegal in Russia and punishable by up to 10 years in prison. 
Griner's international case faces an uphill battle since fewer than 1% of defendants in Russian criminal cases are acquitted. Russian authorities have not said how much of the cannabis-based product she had on her at the time of her arrest. Overnight, her Mercury coach and teammates continue to voice their support. It's tough um, every time we're a reminder of you know, their teammate, their friend, wrongfully imprisoned in another country. Hopefully, President Biden will take the steps to ensure that she comes home. And Kira, Brittany Griner is one of about 40, according to the State Department, Americans around the world considered to be wrongfully detained, including one, yes, right there in Russia, who's been there for years, Paul Whelan, that they're also working to get home. We'll follow it. TJ, thanks. And coming up, riveting testimony on Capitol Hill today. We've got our powerhouse political roundtable joining us to break it all down right after this. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. More Americans choose ABC News, America's number one news source. Steve, Martin, Selena. This week, they're taking a break from solving murders in the building to be on GMA. Fantastic. <laughs> Plus, country music star Jimmy Allen performing for you this week on... Good Morning America. This is GMA 3, what you need to know. GMA 3. A third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon. It's all about you. Lunchtime on ABC. Every killer just might think they're pulling off the perfect crime until, well, it's not. What little breadcrumbs do they leave behind? What gives them away? Did the killer commit the perfect crime? Or did he leave one clue? The new true crime series. Because what's often hiding in plain sight between four walls is the fatal flaw. Premieres Thursday night, July 7 on ABC. What are you capable of when you sleep? My wife was asleep on the couch and I kissed her goodnight and went to bed myself. What do you remember? I could see that maybe he was sleepwalking. Sleepwalking? Sleepwalking. What don't you remember? Oh my God. Well, would you remember this? You just murdered your wife. Stabbing her 44 times. I went to bed and when I woke up, my wife is dead and the cops had me on the floor. You do realize how unbelievable this sounds. While he was sleeping, the 2020 event. Friday at 9, 8 central on ABC. Testimony from today's January 6th hearing was nothing but jaw-dropping. Cassidy Hutchinson, a former top advisor to President Trump's chief of staff, Mark Meadows, revealing stunning new details about what happened that violent and deadly day on January 6th. We have team coverage with our Alex Prache up there on Capitol Hill, along with our contributors, Elizabeth Wydra, former Virginia Congresswoman Barbara Comstock, former North Dakota Senator Heidi Heitkamp, and of course, our political director, Rick Klein. Alex, let's start Start with you. You're there on the Hill. What a hearing. Tell me what stood out to you and what's the response been to Cassidy Hutchinson since this wrapped up today? Well, Kira, you've been up here in these rotundas. You know how loud and boisterous they can get. I can tell you during that nearly two hours of testimony, uh, the vast majority, the only thing that you heard here was that actual programming, her testimony, because so many what people were glued uh, and, and watching. One of the things, uh, I had a colleague who passed by and uh, as this was wrapping and said, well, that was crazy. But I mean, I think going into this, we knew that uh, Cassidy Hutchinson was gonna be used to connect the dots. Few people have as much insight as she did to the Trump White House, also his schedule, who might be talking with the former president, and the actions of his chief of staff. And so we heard Cassidy Hutchinson uh, talk about the knowledge of possible violence in the days leading up to January 6th. We heard her testify to uh, the, the insurrection, uh, or excuse me, that uh, the, the, the president's speech in the metal detectors and the president wanting to have these metal detectors removed so they could fill in the crowd. We, we heard about 
about her testimony about his insistence on going to the Capitol that day, and then also uh, that interaction, that altercation with a member of his, his security detail uh, that played out like you know something out of out of a movie, and then something else that really uh, uh, was drilled down on here: uh, that conversation in the White House between Mark Meadows and Pat uh, Cip uh, Cipollone about Mike Pence getting what he deserved. The president believed that he was getting what he deserved and didn't believe that he needed to say anything further to those protesters. Uh, really, really riveting testimony here. And I think the last thing uh, that stood out to me, uh, Akira, and this, this is something to pay attention to going forward, these closing remarks by Vice Chair Liz Cheney uh, saying they think they have evidence of witness tampering and obstruction of justice, uh, that is something uh, that I think is going to come up again in July. Oh, a lot's going to come up, I think. Uh, Elizabeth, you know, Cassidy testified that she was scared and nervous on the days leading up to the Capitol attack. She had overheard phone calls and conversations um, that truly rattled her to the core. What stood out to you? I think that was a really key piece of information that, frankly, the testimony today was very damning for uh, obviously President Trump, but also Mark Meadows that they knew that leading up to January 6th, it could be violent. In Mark Meadows' words to Cassidy Hutchinson, it could get real, real bad. Um, the morning of, she gave this very compelling uh, narrative of the day where they knew that people were there, they were armed, that Trump said, take away the metal detectors, let them in. Even he said he didn't care if they had weapons, they're not here to hurt me, and that they could march to the Capitol from there. You know, he knew that it was unsafe for him to go to the Capitol if this violence was taking place. And not only did he try to, did he not try to stop it, he tried to go there by grabbing the steering wheel and then lunging at his security details neck. And then again, when he's back in the Oval Office in the West Wing and hears that they're chanting, hang Mike Pence, not only did he not try to step in to stop the violence, he said that maybe they're getting what maybe Mike Pence is getting what he deserves. So this is very damning evidence against President Trump and Mark Meadows. And, you know, I'm sure that the Department of Justice is paying very close attention to this. And, you know, I think the question is going to be, what's the accountability now? Barbara, are you surprised by how much Cassidy knew? No, not at all, because a staffer who is there around you, I mean, I often call my past staff and say, do you remember this person or do you remember that? Because they remember better than the principal does. So it makes total sense to me. And so this was a devastating, you know, and smoking guns just every which way, literally smoking guns. When the president was trying, Donald Trump was trying to lead an armed insurrection to the Capitol. And that started before that, because they knew this mob was coming in and could be dangerous. And then he knew they were armed when he directed them to go to the Capitol. And then, he wanted to go up because he knew he was in no danger. These people didn't want to harm him. They wanted to hang Mike Pence. They wanted to harm Democrats or Republicans. I mean, he also attacked Liz Cheney in this speech. They've ignored that. And that was alarming enough that her father called her that morning to tell her he's attacking you. So I think this is devastating. Like Mick Mulvaney said, I think it is honest. I think you're going to see Republicans, some now saying, oh, gee, I don't really remember that. They'll do the I don't recall stuff. But this is, they, they you know, Pat Cipollone know this, this happened. Mark Meadows knows. And the best you're going to get from some of these guys is a, well, I don't really remember that well. I was really busy. I was worried about all these other things. It's the, they know this happened, and it was willful looking the other way, trying to ignore with this petulant child that they were working for, who, I mean, of all people, Kevin McCarthy is calling Cassidy that day and yelling at her for Donald Trump saying he's send, you know, sending people down to the Capitol and is telling a 25-year-old, you've got to stop him. Where uh. were the adults in the room? She stopped it, and God bless Cassidy Hutchison and Liz Cheney, these are the women we need to deal with the boys, the Trump eunuchs who couldn't stand up and do anything. They're a disgrace, and they need to be put under oath in a grand jury and, and, and get at this, and I think there's going to be some serious criminal problems.
Well, I can't wait to see what job offers Cassidy uh, Hutchinson gets, that's for sure. Uh, Heidi, let me take this to you, because this is something that we didn't know. Um, President Trump's s s uh, Secret Service agent, Bob Engel, who was driving the beast, he's the one that, what, that, that Trump got in to with him and Trump said to him, according to Cassidy Hutchinson, you know, you take me to the Capitol. And he said, no, sir, I'm not going to take you there. And I'm the effing president. I can do whatever I want. You're going to take me there. And they got into this tussle uh, right here in the beast. You can see arms waving. And according to Cassidy Hutchinson, uh, the president lunged at him um, physically uh, assaulting him, according to her. Uh, when, I mean, that is just unprecedented. When have you ever heard something like this before? I mean, th this is, it just really goes to show um, the mindset uh, uh, of Trump and how far he was going to go to, to, to push the big lie. Yeah, I, I think what you're really hearing is Trump devolving. I mean, if he ever had the ability to kind of uh, to, to retain decorum, we know now it was getting worse and worse as time went on. But I always say when people tell you who they are, believe them. I mean, he told us he could shoot someone on Fifth Avenue and he would still have followers. These were his people, which incidentally, the next day they said they were Antifa. But the day before, he said, they're not going to hurt me. They're my people. He wanted to lead them. That was the image that he wanted, was the leader. And when he was told no, um, he he did what he did, and I have no doubt or any reason not to believe her. Now, it's going to be very hard to get the Secret Service to come forward, but I think the real question here is... But they could, is, though, right, Heidi? Yeah, they could. Well, they could, they could but, come forward. Yeah, but this is a group of people, you know, the kind of... Um, kind of uh, it's 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 not in the law but it is our tradition and how do we ever get a president to believe that they can be themselves around us if later on we we go to a television station and talk about what happened in those private moments so I doubt that you're going to see the Secret Service stepping up but I will tell you this the question that I have is is the courage of a 25 year old young woman with the life ahead of her is her her courage that she showed today is it contagious. Can we expect other Republicans to step up and say, you know, in the rear view mirror of history, I want to be on the right side of this. And I think you saw a 25 year old with incredible poise and no real reason to tell us anything but the truth. And so hooray to her. And, you know, let's hope that it gets more people to step up and do the right thing. We got less than, a, than 45 seconds, Rick. I'm going to give the final thought to you. Impact of Cassidy Hutchinson. It's a historic day. We learned things we never did before about the narrative, and I think it puts a real burden on those who, as, as Heidi Heitkamp just said, haven't come forward to testify. What's the reasoning for that? And for people around her, they've got ample opportunity to try to rebut what we heard today without that and with only Trump's angry rants on Truth Social to go off of. What her word is is the word, and, it, and going unchallenged, I think, speaks volumes as well for the Republican Party. He still is the leader of the Republican Party, and as this committee has made clear, the threats did not end on January 6th. They are real and relevant continuing today. And I think that is what is going to put a lot of burden on others to, to come forward one and, and land one way or the other, as we heard today from Cassidy Hutchinson. Thank you all. And thank you all for joining us. I'm Kira Phillips. If you missed today's unbelievable hearing, we will rerun it in full later tonight at 11 p.m. Eastern and again right now.